Section Zero of More Australian Legendary Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Beeswax Candle. More Australian Legendary Tales by K. Langlow Parker. Preface. I must begin the preface to a new series of Australian legendary tales by thanking the press and public for the, to the collector, gratifying reception they gave the first one. There are many persons who have individually expressed their interest in my work so kindly that I would like to name them here and publicly thank them, but some of them are of such worldwide fame that to do so might seem mere self-advertisement at their expense. Should this come into their notice, they will, I hope, understand my reticence and accept my gratitude. The present series of legends have all been collected by myself from the blacks, as were the previous ones. But in this instance, I had much help given to me by friends who either told or sent me scraps of legends they themselves had seen or heard. On receiving any such, I immediately made inquiries amongst the blacks, and I was often enabled to complete the scraps, gaining through their hints a whole legend. For should the local tribes know nothing of what I wanted to hear, I would get them to make inquiries of wandering blacks from other tribes whom they might meet during their periodic walkabouts or at corroborees they attended. I myself have had opportunities of knowing well members of nine tribes, though that which I know best is the Yohalei speaking one, of which the Nungabaras are a branch. As far as I know, only one of the legends in this series has previously been printed in Tyre. This is one of my own collecting from a Wirajari blackfellow, the Crane and the Crow, and appeared in the Sydney Bulletin. Some of the blacks who have helped to build up this series belong to the Murrumbidgee, Darling, Barwon, Paru, Warejo, Naran, Kulgoa and Castlereagh rivers. The Braidwood, Yes, Narrabri and other districts of New South Wales to the Boulogne, Maranoa, Condamine, Baku, Mulligan Rivers, and the Gulf Country in Queensland. But I have confined myself, as far as possible, to the Nungabara names, thinking it would create confusion if I used those of each dialect. Several different names, for example, for one bird or beast. To such as were told in song, I have tried to retain something of the rhythmical rendering. I have no doubt a skilled writer could have mosaic these legendary scraps with flowery language into a beautiful work of art. But I have preferred to let the blacks, as far as possible, tell their legends in their own way, only adding such explanations as seemed necessary to make them clear to the English reader. I trust the fact that these legends belong to a stone age, an age when everything was rough-hewn, will not be lost sight of by readers. Ever since I have been collecting folklore, I have endeavoured to keep as many of the coloured people about me as I could in various capacities, even going the length that Uncle Ramus's creator did, namely of, at times, sacrificing digestion to sentiment, the practical result of which has been that many scraps of folklore were revealed to me, of which, but for this daily intercourse, I should probably never have heard. For instance, a young Bootha brought in the lamp one evening, Seeing some big grey moths fluttering around it, she said, No good. Come be jigun. Naringa helida. No tomahawks here. You'll get burnt for nothing. Then I learnt that the spirits send these grey moths as soon as it is dark to the camps to steal tomahawks for them. The bag-like back of their bodies is supposed to be the combi. Bag, they carry these in if they get them but most often they are dazzled by the light of the fires and blindly flutter into them, getting singed as they do round the lamp. While walking through the bush after heavy rain, I came across some very brilliant fungi growing onto dead trees. I picked off a piece, and on my return, going out to speak to some of the blacks, I carried this fungus in my hand. A little black child, seeing its bright colour, came towards me as if to get it, but his mother quickly interposed, saying in an alarmed tone, Don't let him touch it. It is way, way. Don't let him touch it. Then she told me that all fungi growing on trees were the bread of ghosts, and if a child touched any, he would be spirited away by the ghosts. She said these fungi were luminous at night so that the ghosts could see them. Walking through the bush, as I often do, with some of the blacks, I hear many little scraps. 
Quite lately, while going along the edge of one of the plains, we put up some spur-winged plover, which went off harshly screeching. I asked why the bird had that strange spur. Because, they said, a long time ago, a black fellow called Bala Dara Dara, as the plovers are now, had been noted for never going abroad without poison-tipped spears, from which even a scratch was fatal. When he died, he was turned into a plover, and has his spears still in the modified form of the spurs on the wings. He brings these forward if he wishes to injure anything, holding it between them with fatal result. On similar occasions, I learnt that when the sun, as it sometimes does in summer, goes down like a fiery red ball, it is the reflection of wattle gum on it that makes it so bright. After such a sunset, if they go out for gum, they are certain to find quantities, they say. The gum they melt in water, making it a half-liquid jelly which they eat with relish, which they say has great strengthening properties. That when the moon looks very yellow, after it has risen on a winter's evening, it is a sign of frost. The Miyame have told Balu they will send frost tonight. He is going to keep himself warm. Look at his bright fire, they say. When they see a tree that usually grows on the plains on the ridges, or vice versa, they say, There are two who have married wrongly. That Kulaba must have run away from her tribe with a bibble, and now the weary nuns or wizards have turned them into trees. Often come into contact with instances of their deeply ingrained superstitions. One morning, a very fine, healthy specimen of a young native woman was scrubbing the verandas. As I passed her, she said, I might die soon, Inara. They call me Inara in the sense of boss woman. On inquiry, I found some young man whom she had declined to marry had stolen a lock of her hair. He was now making his way with it to the Wirinans of the Bukaru. Should he reach them, and they agree to burn it, she would die. There was some hope for her, she said. Her totem clan, the Biwis, were very strong out that way, and having been warned, might intercept him. Should he succeed in causing her death, so long as any of her tribe were alive, they would be at enmity with his, and the feud would go on from generation to generation. Another day, a girl came to borrow a horse to go down the river to see her sister, whose baby, a messenger had just come to tell her, was dead. She went, and on her return, I asked if the baby was buried. She told me the weary nuns had put its breath back in it, and it was alive again. On my doubting that it had really been dead, she brought two or three witnesses to corroborate her story, and they described how the two weary nuns had caught the breath just after it left the body, put it back through the child's mouth, and then set to work to suck the sickness out of the body, with the result that the baby recovered. It was in the summer of 1896, when the six weeks of a heat wave caused so many deaths in this district from heat apoplexy, that the blacks first saw Marmbeya, the ghost with the green bundi, about here. The next summer I said one day to a black woman that I hoped we should not hear of so many deaths that season. Oh no, she said, there won't be any this year because a black fellow has killed Marambeya, who caused the deaths by knocking the people on the back of their necks with his green bundi. The black fellow was supposed to have seen this evil-dealing ghost in front of him one day, he himself being unobserved, when he stole up and flattened him with his bundi, thus saving his people and the whites from further sickness of the heat apoplexy kind. We have in the camp an old woman who is supposed to call up spirits, and they do come. She gave us a test of her power one day, which I am bound to say compared favourably with any seances of a like nature I have seen before, inasmuch as she held hers in the light of day. She never drinks hot tea, nor any sort of liquid that would heat her internally. Did she do so, she says the spirits would be driven out, and she be powerless as a medium of communication with them. It is, she says, because the black people drink the grog of the white people that they are losing their ancient power. In the past, they never drank any hot liquid. It was the same old woman who accurately foretold the breaking up of a drought. The oldest woman of this tribe, having died, was buried the next day. The blacks told me I could go to the funeral, and on the way the old spiritualist walked beside me. Seeing the droughty desolation of the country, I asked her when she thought it would rain again, Coming very close to me, she half whispered, In three days, I think it. Old be money, tell me when she dying, that supposing she can send him rain, she send him three day. 
where her yowie go long, oh boy, oh boy. Bimani died on Wednesday night. We went to bed on Saturday with the skies as cloudless as they had been for weeks. Middle of the night, we were awakened by the patter of raindrops on the iron roof. All night it rained, and all the next day. Since my first series came out, I have heard some items which more fitly complete four of the legends in it, which completions I now add. To Mulyanga, the morning star, might be added that under the tree in which Mulyan's gahame, or camp, was, the spring of water which was there then is still so, and from time to time it throws up various sorts of mammoth and strange bones belonging to a past age, which the blacks say are the remains of Mulyan's many victims, whose bones were dropped from the tree into the spring called Gadi, which is in the Briwarina district. To the Gala and Ula, the lizard, some blacks add that the present colouring of the bird, grey and rose pink, is owing to her having rolled in the dust as the blood streamed down both sides of her head from the wound the Babara, thrown by Ula, had made, staining forever her breast and under parts of her wings, the dust toning the blood red down to rose pink. It is to the legend of Morigo the Mopok and Balu the Moon that we owe a black fellow's reason for a halo round the moon. Ever since the storm in that legend, when Balu built himself a dadur, he has done so before rain. Seeing a halo, the blacks say, Balu has built his dadur, there will be rain. To Diriri, the wagtail and the rainbow, they add that Bibi, who made the Ulururi, or rainbow, put snakes at its end to guard it, and if anyone goes near it, these savage flat-headed snakes will kill them. The former series were all such legends as are told to the black Piccaninnies. Among the present are some they would not be allowed to hear, touching as they do on sacred subjects, taboo to the young. The legend of Na Ungaui, the sacred island, was not heard directly by myself from the blacks, but was first told to me when a child by my grandmother, and was sent recently to me by my uncle in much the same form having been told to him by a full-blooded Aboriginal of southern South Australia. To the legend of Dinawan the Emu and Juan the Crows, some natives add that when Dinawan's wives, the crows, threw the hot coals over him, his wings were burnt off, and that singed appearance which has been theirs ever since given to the feathers where the stumps of the wings are. K. Langlo Parker, Bangate, Naran River, New South Wales, September 1898. Introduction. Mrs. Langlo Parker has requested me to write a little foreword to her new collection of Australian popular tales. Good wine, like these stories, needs no bush, and Mrs. Parker's intimate knowledge of the bush and its wild native lords cannot be improved by any merely literary information. Yet one would not willingly disoblige a lady to whom children owe so much for her legends, and who has so remarkably vindicated the thoroughly human and amiable character of an unfortunate people. These dark, backward friends of hers, the blacks, are, we find, very much like you and me, as Mr. Kipling says. Or rather, they are our superiors in poetical fancy. Without our savage ancestors, we should certainly have had no poetry. Conceive the human race born into the world in its present advanced condition, weighing, analysing, examining everything, except a few phenomena which happen not to chime in with the general idea of science. Such a race would have been destitute of poetry and flattened by common sense. The world would never have been dispeopled of its dreams, because there would have been no dreamers. Barbarians did the dreaming for the world, poetry arose in their fancies, and poetry, in spite of facts and science, resolutely refuses to follow darkness like a dream. Mrs. Parker's collection demonstrates that among the world's dreamers, the Australians, just escaping from the Paleolithic age, were among the most distinguished. On many points we need further information. It is commonly said that the Baraks or native necromants, have disappeared. But Mrs. Parker has seen one, a woman, who's called the Spirits Obey, and who, like Dee Dee Home, works her marvels in open day. We have had no accounts of an Australian, though we have several accounts of Maori, Guiana, and Red Indian seances. 
One hopes that Mrs. Parker will fill up the lacuna with a detailed report of her own observations, to which she briefly refers. Anthropology has no reason for neglecting these affairs any more than the countless other things in which savage practice tallies with the mysticisms of civilization. Many of the myths are etiological. They account for origins. The tales of the West Wind, of the Mirage Maker, of the Blood Flowers, and others are highly poetical. Ovid would have found in them excellent material for more metamorphoses. The girl who sang new songs, which she said the spirits taught her, merely gave the animistic explanation of her own genius. Their voices come to me on every breeze, as to the girl of Dom Raimi. The stories are tender with human affection. There are interesting traits for the student of animism, as when Piggy Billa sleeps on his face that his doughy or dream spirit may not leave him while he slumbers. Waruna is eager to know where Bayami is, the good being who made and instructed mankind, who is withdrawn to heaven which is his home, leaving laws not to be broken. We see the blacks seeking after God, if perhaps he may find him, dreaming the great dream of the universal father, the friend of righteousness, as it is understood by the tribes, who receives his children into everlasting habitations. Bayami is at once the god and the culture hero in these myths. He made the stone fisheries, which Mr. Gideon Scott Lang many years ago described to me as the only material evidence of a time of more organization and enterprise among the blacks than now exist. The legend of the flowers is the most important example of the Bayami creed in this volume. The flowers all followed Bayami when he retired from earth and went to Bulima, the land of rest. I cannot persuade myself that Bayami and Bulima are echoes of Christian teaching. Waits has rejected that idea, and I see no evidence that we white devils have largely influenced native belief. These stories reflect human hopes, and the world's desire, things natural, untaught, inevitable. The all-seeing spirit is here distinguished from Bayami. But in Mr. Howitt's accounts, Durumbulan, another name for the same conception, can himself see and hear everything. Bayami has spirits who do his bidding, as in Walagurunboan, whose voice is heard through the Gayandi, the Tundan or rule roarer. Bayami is now, like the Fijian Gaji, fixed and frozen to permanence, on his crystal rock in the land of rest. The souls of those who keep his law go to him. The wicked go to Ilyanba, Wunda, the native inferno. All this is in direct contradiction to the odd theory that morals among low savages have no religious sanction. That theory cannot long resist the impact of accumulating evidence. We are in truth all alike, and from an unknown antiquity the maker of men has also been their judge. I have elsewhere argued, in the making of religion, that such beings as Bayami are not the ghosts of an ancestor carried to the highest power. Ancestor worship I do not discover in Australia. Mr Dawson reports the habit of ghost feeding the supposed origin of religion, is recent, and that the blacks call it white fellows gammon. Mr. Dawson found a deity called Purnmihal, a good being. The aborigines say that the missionaries and government protectors have given them a dread of Purnmihal, and they are sorry that the young people, and many of the old, are now afraid of a being who never did any harm to their forefathers. Mr. Dawson received his information in the native languages and sifted it carefully. We have seen what he regards as the result of the teaching of the white devils, missionaries and others. If he is right, if providing food for it, the corpse or ghost, is a recent custom, what becomes of Mr. Herbert Spencer's theory? If Mr. Dawson is right, in Australia we surprise religion already possessed of a god on his way to be otios. Biomi sits like Keats, grey-haired Saturn, quiet as a stone, and Pernmihal is seldom mentioned. Elsewhere, Durumbulan is served in the secret rites of the mysteries. None of these gods receive food or sacrifice. Religion is at this point, and is only just beginning to turn towards animism. Corpse feeding is recent. In Mrs. Parker's book, Biomi is implored to receive the soul of Irin, for Erin was faithful on earth, faithful to the laws you left us. The mourners, 
let their blood drop into his grave. But such a sacrifice is not necessarily more than a tribute of affectionate regret. It need not imply feeding, while of later sacrifices to spirits I have vainly looked for a trace. Now, by a mythical inconsistency, the spirit of Erin, or one of his spirits, perhaps as Dewey, dwells in a grey owl. Here then is a kind of theism, and beside it only the germs of an animism which is not yet a religion of service and propitiation of ancestors. This helps my argument that theism is not the latest flower of animism very well, and Mr. Dawson, as far as his evidence attests, has no theory to prove or disprove. Mrs. Parker has, in manuscript, a considerable body of evidence as to both the religion and the mythology of Biamy. I have maintained in this case, on the evidence of Mr. Howard, an initiate that religion and mythology represent quite different moods of men. In religion, the Australian is serious and will not mention the master except at the solemn mysteries. In mythology, he is either curious when making fanciful explanations of facts, or he is romantic and humorous, telling stories for pleasure about Bayami or Durumulan, whom he now envisages not as father and judge, but very much as a black fellow, like himself. Grant such a black fellow unlimited power, and he will frolic as in the Australian and other mythologies. Consider him as the maker and lawgiver, the all-seeing witness and rewarder of conduct, and Bayami or Durumulan is no longer the wanton, gigantic Wirinun, rather is he God. I am unable to see any inconsistency between my notion of a kind of early theism and my belief that many of the absurdities of mythology are the result and, in civilization, the survival of the savage intellectual condition. Odd stories enough about our Lord, the Virgin and the Saints occur in our European folklore. These are mythical popular accretions, like the similar tales about Biamy. But neither our creed nor that of the Australians began in buffoonery. To these themes, and to a wider and more minute examination of Australian religion, I hope some day to return. Meanwhile, the literary merit of the tales collected by Mrs. Parker may teach us not to be surprised by traces of elevated thought and morality in the religious traditions of this people, so low in the scale of culture that no remains of the rudest pottery have been discovered in the soil of the continent. Andrew Lang End of section 0Section 1 of More Australian Legendary Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Cooper Watmo. More Australian Legendary Tales by K. Langlow Parker. The Crane and the Crow. The crane was a great fisherman. He used to hunt out the fish with his feet from underneath the logs in the creek and so catch numbers. One day, when he had a great many on the bank of the creek, a crow, who was white at that time, came up. He asked the crane to give him some fish. Wait a while, said the crane, until they are cooked. But the crow was hungry and impatient and would not cease bothering the crane, who kept saying, Wait, wait. Presently, the crane turned his back. The crow sneaked up and was just going to steal a fish. The crane turned round, saw him, seized the fish, and hit the crow right across the eyes with it. The crow felt blinded for a few minutes. He fell on the burnt black grass round the fire and rolled over and over in his pain. When he got up to go away, his eyes were white and the rest of him black as crows have been ever since. The crow was determined to pay out the crane for having given him white eyes and a black skin. So he watched his chance, and one day when he saw the crane fast asleep, he crept quietly up to him holding a fish bone. This he stuck right across the root of the crane's tongue. Then he went off as quietly as he had come, careful for once, to make no noise. The crane woke up at last 
and when he opened his mouth to yawn, he felt like choking. He tried to get the obstruction out of his throat. In the effort, he made a queer, scraping noise, which was all he could give utterance to. The bone stuck fast. And to this day, the only noise a crane can make is Garaga, Garaga. This noise gives the name by which he is known to the blacks. End of chapter 1「Section 2 of More Australian Legendary Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Cooper Watmo. More Australian Legendary Tales by K. Langlo Parker. Biriun the Mirage Maker. Biriun the Lizard wanted to marry Bulai Bulai, the green parrot sisters but they did not want to marry him. They liked Weeda, the Mockingbird, better. Their mother said they must marry Biriun, for she had pledged them to him at their births, and Biriun was a great Wirinun and would harm them if they did not keep her pledge. When Weeda came back from hunting, they told him what their mother had said, how they had been pledged to Biriun, who now claimed them. Tomorrow, said Weeda, Old Biriun goes to meet a tribe from the Springs country. While he is away, we will go towards the big river and burn the track behind us. I will go out as if to hunt as usual in the morning. I will hide myself in the thick Gidya scrub. You two must follow later and meet me there. We will then cross the big plain where the grass is now thick and dry. Bring with you a fire stick. We will throw it back into the plain. Then no one can follow our tracks. On we go to the big river. There I have a friend who has a gumbilga, or canoe. Then shall we be safe from pursuit, for he will put us over the river. And we can travel on and on, even to the country of the short-armed people, if so we choose. The next morning ere Gagor Gaga had ceased his laughter, Wida had started. Some hours later, in the Gidya scrub, the Bulai Bulai sisters joined him. Having crossed the big plain, they threw back a fire stick, where the grass was thick and dry. The fire sped quickly through it, crackling and throwing up tongues of flame. Through another scrub went the three, then across another plain, through another scrub, and onto a plain again. The day was hot, ye, the sun, was high in the sky. They became thirsty, but saw no water, and had brought none in their haste. We want water! the Bulai Bulai cried. Why did you not bring some? said Weeda. We thought you had plenty, or would travel as the creeks run, or at least know of a gulagul, or water-holding tree. We shall soon reach water. Look even now ahead. There is water. The Bulai Bulai looked eagerly towards where he pointed, and there in truth, on the far side of the plain, they saw a sheet of water. They quickened their steps, but the further they went, the further off seemed the water, but on they went, ever hoping to reach it. Across the plain they went, only to find on the other side a belt of timber. The water had gone. The weary girls would have laid down, but Weeda said that they would surely reach water on the other side of the wood. Again they struggled on through the scrub and to another plain. There it is. I told you, there is water. And looking ahead, they again saw a sheet of water. Again their hopes were raised, and though the sun beat fiercely on them, they marched, only to be again disappointed. Let us go back, they said. This is the country of evil spirits. We see water, and when we come where we have seen it, there is but dry earth. Let us go back. Back to Biriun, who would kill you? Better to die from the blow of a bundi in your own country than of thirst in a land of devils. We will go back. Not so, not with a bundi would he kill you, but with a gowira or poison stick. Slow would be your deaths, and you would be always in pain until your shadow was wasted away. But why talk of returning? Did we not set fire to the big plain? Could you cross that? Waste not your breaths, but follow me. See, there again is water. But the bulai bulai had lost hope. 
No longer would they even look up, though time after time Weta called out, Water ahead of us! Water ahead of us! Only to again and again disappoint them. At last the Bulai Bulai became so angry with him that they seized him and beat him. But even as they beat him, he cried all the time, Water is there! Water is there! Then he implored them to let him go, and he would drag up the roots for some water trees and drain the water from these for them. Yonder I see a kulaba. From its roots I can drain enough to quench your thirst. Or here beside us is a bingawingle. Full of water are its roots. Let me go. I will drain them for you. But the Bulai Bulai had no faith in his promises, and they but beat him the harder until they were exhausted. When they ceased to beat him and let him go, Weta went on a little way, then lay down, feeling bruised all over and thankful that the night had come and the fierce sun no longer scorched them. One Bulai Bulai said to her sister, Could we not sing the song our Bargy used to sing and make the rain fall? Let us try if we can make the sound with our dry throats, said the other. We will sing to our cousin Dulumai the thunder. He will hear us and break a rain cloud for us. So they sat down, rocking their bodies to and fro, and beating their knees, saying, Mugari, Mugare, May May, Ihu, Ihu, Dungara. Over and over again they sang these words as they had heard their bargi, or grandmother, do. Then for themselves they added, Ihu, Una, Wambane, Dulumai, Bulu, Gunun, Indir, Gingi, Ihu, Una, Wambane, Dulumai, which meant, Give us rain, thunder, our cousin. Thirsting for water are we. Give us rain, thunder, our cousin. As long as their poor parched throats could make a sound, they sang this. Then they lay down to die, weary and hopeless. One said faintly, The rain will be too late, but surely it is coming, for strong is the smell of the Gidya. Strong indeed, said the other. But even this sure sign to their tribe that rain is near roused them not. It would come, they thought, too late for them. But even then away in the north a thunder cloud was gathering. It rolled across the sky quickly, peeling out thunder calls as it came to tell of its coming. It stopped right over the plain in front of the Bulai Bulai. One more peal of thunder, which opened the cloud, then splashing down came the first big drops of rain. Slowly and few they came, until just at the last, when a quick, heavy shower fell, emptying the thundercloud and filling the Gilgai holes on the plain. The cool splashing of the rain on their hot, tired limbs gave new life to the Bulai Bulai and Wida. They all ran to the Gilgai holes. Stooping their heads, they drank and quenched their thirst. I told you the water was here, said Wida. You see, I was right. No water was here when you said so. If our cousin Dulumai had not heard our song for his help, we should have died, and you too. And they were angry, but Weta dug them some roots, and when they ate they forgot their anger. When their meal was over, they lay down to sleep. The next morning on they went again. That day they again saw across the plains the same strange semblance of water which had lured them on before. They knew not what it could be, only they knew that it was not water. Just at dusk they came to the big river. There they saw Guleyali, the pelican, with his canoe. Wida asked him to put them over on to the other side. He said he would do so one at a time, as the canoe was small. First he said he would take Wida, that he might get ready a camp of the long grass in the bend of the river. He took Wida over, then back he came, and, fastening his canoe, he went up to the Bulai Bulai, who were sitting beside the remains of his old fire. Now, said Guleyali, you two will go with me to my camp, which is down in that bend. Wida cannot get over again. You shall live with me. I shall catch fish to feed you. I have some even now in my camp cooking. There, too, I have wearies of honey and Duri, but ready for the baking. Wida has nothing to give you but the grass Niyunus he but now is making. Take us to Wida, they said. Not so. 
said Gule Yali, and he stepped forward as if to seize them. The Bulai Bulai stooped, filled their hands with the white ashes of the burnt-out fire, which they flung at him. Handful after handful they threw at him, until he stood before them white, all but his hands, which he spread out and shook, thus freeing him from the cloud of ashes enveloping him and obscuring his sight. Having thus checked him, the Bulai Bulai ran to the bank of the river, meaning to get the canoe and cross over to Wida. But in the canoe, to their horror, was Biriun, Biriun, to escape whom they had sped across the plain and through scrub. Yet here he was, while between them and Wida lay the wide river. They had not known it, but Biriun had been near them all the while. He it was who had made the mirage on each plain, thinking he would lure them on by the semblance of water until they perished of thirst. From that Dulumai, their cousin, had saved them. But now the chance of Biriun had come. The Bulai Bulai looked across the wide river and saw the Niyunus Wida had made. They saw him running in and out of them as if he were playing a game, not thinking of them at all. Strange Niyunus they were too, having both ends open. Seeing where they were looking, Biriun said, Wida is Mumba, deaf. I stole his dewey while he slept and put in its place a mad spirit. He knows not of you now. He cares not for you. It is so with those who look too long at the ear deer or mirage. He will trouble me no more, nor you. Why look at him? But the Bulai Bulai could not take their eyes from Wida. So strangely he went on, unceasingly running in at one end of the grass Niyunus, through it and out of the other. He is Wumba, they said. But yet they could not understand it. They looked towards him and called to him, though he heeded them not. I will send him far from you, said Biriun, getting angry. He seized the spear, stood up in the canoe, and sent it swiftly through the air into Wida, who gave a great cry, screamed, Water is there, water is there, and fell back dead. Take us over, take us over, cried the Bulai Bulai. We must go to him. We might yet save him. He is all right. He is in the sky. He is not there, said Biriun. If you want him, you must follow him to the sky. Look, you can see him there now, and he pointed to a star which the Bulai Bulai had never seen before. There he is, Wumba. Across to the grass Niyunus the Bulai Bulai looked, but no Wida was there. Then they sat down and wailed a death song, for they knew well they should see Wida no more. They plastered their heads with white ashes and water. They tied on their bodies green twigs. Then, cutting themselves till the blood ran, they lit some smoke branches and smoked themselves as widows. Biriun spoke to Guleali, the pelican, saying, There is no brother of the dead man to marry these women. In this country they have no relation. You shall take one and I the other. Tonight when they sleep we will each seize one. That which you say shall be, said Guleali the pelican. But the sisters heard what they said, though they gave no sign and mourned the dead Wida without ceasing. And with their death song they mingled a cry to all of their tribe who were dead to help them and save them from these men who would seize them while they were still mourning, before they had swallowed the smoke water or their tribe had heard the voice of their dead. As the night wore on, the wailing of the women ceased. The men thought that they were at length asleep and crept up to their camp, but lo, it was empty. Gone were the Bulai Bulai. They heard a sound, a sound of mocking laughter. They looked around, but saw nothing. Again they heard a sound of laughter. Whence came it? Again it echoed through the air. It was from the sky. They looked up. It was the new star Wumba mocking them. Wumba, who once was Wida, who laughed aloud to see that the Balai Balai had escaped their enemies, for even now they were stealing along the sky towards him, which the men on earth saw. We have lost them, said Guleali. I shall camp alone, and he turned to go to his dardur. They shall not escape me, said Biriun. I shall make a roadway to the skies and follow them. Thence shall I bring them back, or wreak my vengeance on them. He went to the canoe where were his spears. Having grasped them, 
he took two the spears of Guleali, which lay by the smoldering fire. He chose a barbed one. With all his force he threw it up to the sky. The barb caught there, the spear hung down. Biryu threw another which caught on to the first, and yet another, and so on, each catching the one before it, until he could touch the lowest from the earth. This he clutched hold of, and climbed up, 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 until he reached the sky. Then he started in pursuit of the Bulai Bulai, and he is still pursuing them. Since then, the tribe of Biriun have always been able to swarm up sheer heights. Since then, too, his tribe, the little lizards of the plains, make, just like he did, the mirages to lure on thirsty travelers, only to send them mad before they die of thirst. Since then, Guleali the pelican has been white. Forever did the ashes thrown by the Bulai Bulai cling to him, except where he had shaken them off from his hands, where are a few black feathers. The tribe of Bulai Bulai are colored like the green of the leaves the sisters strung on themselves, in which to mourn Weeda, with here and there a dash of whitish yellow and red caused by the ashes and the blood of their mourning. And Wumba the star the mad star, still shines. Canopus, we call it, and Weeda the mockingbird still builds grass niunus, open at both ends, in and out of which he runs, as if they were but his playground. And the fire that Weeda and the Bulai Bulai made spread from one end of the country to the other, over ridges and across plains, burning the trees so that their trunks have been black ever since. Jinyi, the iron barks, smoldered the longest of all, and their trunks were so seared that the seams were deeply marked in their thick black bark still, making them show out grimly distinct on the ridges to remind the Dayans of Biryun the Mirage Maker forever. End of section two. Chapter three of More Australian Legendary Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Cooper Watmo. More Australian Legendary Tales by K. Langlo Parker. Bora the Kangaroo and Dinawan the Emu. Bora the Kangaroo lived in a grass niunu with his wife Dinawan the Emu. He was a great Wirinun. One evening, when Bora was lying down trying to sleep, Dinawan kept making holes in the roof of the Niyunu. "'What are you doing that for?' asked Bora. "'Just for nothing,' said Dinawan. "'Then get some grass and mend it up. "'There is no grass here. "'Then we will travel until we find some, for you won't let me sleep.' Off they went. It grew darker and darker every minute. Dinawan could not see where she was treading. She trod on bindias, which stuck to her feet and hurt her. Limping along and feeling sore from the prickles, she said, If you are such a great wirinun as you say, surely you could make the dark roll away. Hunt it right away into another country. Let me see where to walk. My feet are very sore. If you could hunt the dark away, then you would be a great wirinun. Oh, my poor sore feet! So crying, she rubbed them against each other, which only made the bindias stick further in, raising rough lumps on her feet, which lumps have been on the feet of her kind ever since, and their legs have been bare and hard up to the knee joint. Now Borod the kangaroo was really a great wirinun. While it was quite dark, he said, We will sleep here, and I will hunt the dark away while we rest. They laid down. As soon as Bora was asleep, he sent his Muli Muli, or dream spirit, out from his body to gather up the darkness and roll it away to the westward. Having done so, back came the Muli Muli to the body of Bora, who now woke up and saw what his spirit had done. He turned to Dinawan, whom he had saw slept with one eye and one ear open that she might see what he would do, and said, my Muli Muli has rolled the night from us. The darkness is no more. It is rolled away forever from me. I and my people from this out shall be able to see, to travel, and feed at night as if it were day. 
for us there is no more darkness. You must feed in the daytime, I can as I please at night. You kept one eye and one ear open, you shall always sleep so. First one side of your head shall go to sleep, and then the other, but never from henceforth, both at once. And since that time, so it has been, even as Bora, the kangaroo, weary noon, said it should be. End of chapter 3「Section 4 of More Australian Legendary Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. More Australian Legendary Tales by K. Langlo Parker. Section 4 Giger Giger, the Cold West Wind. Durun the Night Heron lived near a creek in which was an immense hollow log. This he used both as a fish and a man trap. He was by choice a buna or cannibal. The immense log was hollow and was under the water. In the middle of it, Durun had cut an opening. When a Dane came to his camp, Durun used to ask him to go fishing with him, saying he wanted a mulayur, or mate, as he was like a gundu, one emu living alone. He wanted someone to go to one end of the log and drive the fish to the other, where he could catch them. Seeing sense in this, the Dane would agree, and off they would go, Durun armed with his spear, to spear the fish when they came to his end of the log, so he said. But as soon as he had sent his mulayur off to the far end, he would go along the log to the opening in the middle. Unsuspecting treachery, the Dane would come through the hollow log, driving the fish ahead of him. Directly he was under the opening, Durun would drive his spear swiftly into him, killing him on the spot. Then, Durun would drag his victim out and, dismembering him, cook him. In this way, many men disappeared mysteriously, until at length, a clever crow, Wirinum, determined to solve the riddle of their disappearance. Juan the Crow went to Durun's camp. Durun asked him to go fishing with him, but first offered him some good fagudu, or cod, he had already cooked. Juan agreed, and when they had finished their meal, Durun proposed they should go fishing. But Juan said, I ate too much gudu. It was very fat. I ate a great deal and must have a sleep before I start. All right, plenty of time, said Durun, feeling sure of his man flesh supper. Juan went to sleep that he might send his muli muli, or dream spirit, to find out what was the tribe Durun had in the creek. The muli muli soon found out all about the opening in the top of the log, having done which back he came. Then Juan, having learnt all, woke up and said he was ready. So off they started. Durun showed Juan where to enter the great log, at the far end. Now Juan was a great weary numb, whom Durun had no power to hurt, so he fearlessly went in. Durun waited until he appeared under the opening, then down went the spear, evoking yells of wah, wah, wah from Juan, who nevertheless went on and came out at the other end with the spear. What made you do that, he said, pulling out the spear from where it had struck in him. I did not mean to spear you, said Durun. I thought it was a big gudu. Well, come on, I have had enough fishing, said Juan. You might make a mistake again. On came Durun, thinking Juan really believed it was an accident. But no sooner had he caught up 
one then he found himself speared in his turn and fatally as one struck to slay about this time giger giger the cold west wind had been blowing such hurricanes that the trees had been blown in all directions and the crows humpy scattered everywhere now thought Juan, i will catch giger giger and shut her up in this immense hollow log but first i must dry the water off it this he set to work to do and soon one day when giger giger was tired out after having blown down miles of trees and cut the tribes with her cold blasts Juan sneaked up upon her and drove her into the hollow log which he blocked up at both ends and also at the hole in the middle giger giger roared and howled but to no purpose you only go about destroying things you shall stay where you are said Juan. giger giger promised to be more gentle in the future if only he would let her out sometimes for a long time Juan would not trust her and kept her closely imprisoned but after a while he let her come out occasionally after she promised to blow no more gales sometimes she breaks her word and blows destructively as of old but Juan quickly captures her again and hurries her back to her log prison there are holes now in this log and the breath of giger giger comes through so unless Juan finds a new prison for her one day she will burst forth and then there will be such a gale as never blew across the western plains before. Giger Giger will blast with her breath everything that stands in her way as she rushes to meet her loved Yarage, the spring wind which blows from the east Kumburan, and which had of old been wont to meet Giger Giger as she blew from Dinjara, the west, tempering where they met, her cold with his own balmy warped. Twice a year the winds all met, holding great corroborees and wild revelings. Durandauran came with his scorching breath from Gurbure, the north, to meet his loved Gunyamu, the southeast wind, which came from Buli Medumundi to fan him with her softer cooler breezes until his heat lessened and he scorched those in his path no longer then from nurubuan the south blew nuru nurubin to meet mundewada the northwest wind after the big corroboree the winds parted each to return to his own country hoping to meet again in a few months to again corroboree. Hence the unrest of Giger Giger in the hollow log, and her much wailing that she could not break forth from her prison and rush to mingle her icy breath with the bali one of Yarage. End of section 4 Section 5 of More Australian Legendary Tales this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. More Australian Legendary Tales by K. Wangdo Parker Bilber and Mayra Bilber, the soft-furred sandhill rat, was once a man, and lived in a camp with Mayra, the wind, for a mate. Mayra was a strange mullayer for a man. He was invisible. He could hold conversations with Bilber, but as much as he desired it, Bilber could never see him. One day he said to Mayra, Why do you not become like me, that I might see you? I can see you, said Mayra. Yes, I know that you can, but I cannot see you, only hear you. I know you are there, because you eat the food before you. You catch opossums and get honey. But though I go with you, following your voice, yet I can never see you, and I long to see someone again. But I can see you, so I am all right. But I cannot see you, and I long to see someone again. 
I must travel away somewhere and join others of my tribe. If I could only see you, I would not wish for a better Mullayer. Well, I am off hunting now. Are you coming? No, I will stay in the camp today. Mayra the wind went off, and when evening was at hand, he was not yet back. Suddenly Bilber heard a roaring in the distance, such as he had never heard before. Then he saw, where the sound seemed to be, a column of dust and leaves spouting up. What sort of a storm is this? he asked himself. I never saw anything like it before. I will go up to that sand ridge behind our camp and make a hole in the soft ground into which I will get so that the storm cannot take me away in its fury. Off went Bilber, hard as he could, to the soft sand hill, the storm roaring behind him. There he made a hole and buried himself in it until the windstorm had passed. Up came the wind, tearing onto the ridge, whirling round the camp, sending the bark and boughs flying about. On, on he went round Bilber's hole, but that he could not shift, so howling with impotent rage as he went, he passed on until his voice was heard only in the distance, and at length not at all. After a time, Bilber came out. He had been so safe and warm in his hole, in the sand, that he lived there ever afterwards, and there he took his wife, when he found one, to live. And to this day the Bilber tribe live in burrows in the sand. They still hear the voice of the old Bilber's mate, but never see his face, nor do they hear him speak any longer their language as of old. For so angry was he at Bilber's desire to see his face, or leave him, that he only howls and roars as he rushes past their camps. And never since have any of the tribe seen where he camps, nor does anyone know, except the six winds that blow, and they tell the secret to none. End of section 5「Section 6 of More Australian Legendary Tales」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Smithies More Australian Legendary Tales by K. Langlo Parker Bralga, the Dancing Bird Bralga Nambadi was very fond of going out hunting with her young daughter, Bralga. Her tribe used to tell her she was foolish to do so, that some day the Warra Wilburu would catch them. It was not for old Brolga Numbardi that the Danes cared, but all the camp were proud of young Brolga. She was the merriest girl and the best dancer of all her tribe, the women of whom were for the most part content to click the boomerangs, beat their rolled up opossum skin rugs, and sing, in voices from shrill to sweet, the corroboree songs while the men danced. But not so Brolga. She must dance too and not only the dances she saw the rest dance, but new ones which she taught herself, for every song she heard she set to steps. Sometimes, with laughing eyes, she would whirl round like a boolie or whirlwind. Then suddenly she would change to a stately measure. Then, for variety's sake, perform a series of swift gyrations, as if, indeed, a whirlwind devil had her in his grip. The fame of her dancing spread abroad, and proud indeed was the tribe to whom she belonged, hence their anxiety for her safety, and their dread that the Warra Wilburu would catch her. The Warra Wilburu were two cannibals who lived in the scrub alone, but in spite of all warnings, Bralga Numbadi continued to hunt as usual, with only her daughter for companion. One day, they went out to camp for two or three days. Nothing hurt them the first night, but the next day, the Warra Wilburu surprised and captured them. They gave Brolga Numbadi a severe blow. She fell down and feigned death, lest they should strike her again and kill her. The Warra Wilburu picked her up to carry her off to their camp. They did not wish to hurt young Brolga. They meant to keep her to dance for them. 
They told her so, and gave her their mugil, or stone knife, to carry, telling her to fear nothing and come with them. She went with them, but when they were not looking, she threw the knife away. As soon as they reached the camp, the Warawilbaru asked her for it. They wanted to cut up Brolga Nambadi before cooking her. Brolga said she had put the mugil down where they had rested some way back and had forgotten it. They said, We will go back and get it. You stay here. They started. When they were some way off, the mother said, Are they out of sight yet? Not yet. Wait a little while. Brolga watched them go right away, then told her mother, who immediately jumped up. Off then went both mother and daughter as fast as they could to their own tribe, whom they told what had happened. When the Warawilbaru came back, they were enraged to find not only the daughter, but the mother gone, even she whom they had left, as they thought, dead. No feast, no dance for them that night, unless they recovered their victims, from whose tracks they found that Brolga had actually been able to run beside her daughter. She only feigned death, they said, to deceive us. We will hasten and overtake them before they reach the tribe. Yea, even if they are with the tribe, we will snatch them away. But the Danes were looking out for them, fully armed, seeing which the Warrawilbaru turned and fled the Danes after them in quick pursuit, but they failed to overtake them, and fearing to follow them too far, lest a trap lay ready for them, they returned to the camp. But so wroth were they at the attempt to capture their prized Brolga, their council was held, and the destruction of the Warrawilbaru determined upon. Two of the cleverest Wirinans said they would send their Malimali in whirlwinds after the enemy to catch them. This they did. Whirling along went the boolies with the malimalis in them. Quickly they went along the track of the Warrawilbaru, whom they soon headed, turning them back towards the camp whence they had fled. We will go, said one of the Warrawilbaru to the other, back to the camp ahead of these whirlwinds. We will seize the girl and her mother and fly in another direction. The whirlwinds will miss us in the camp and seize others. We will not be balked. Young Bralga shall be ours to dance before us, and her mother shall make our supper tonight. On, on they fled before the whirlwinds, which gained both size and pace as they followed them. The Danes were so astonished at seeing the Warrawilbaru returning straight towards them, the whirlwinds after them, that they never thought of arming themselves. Into the midst of them rushed the Warrawilbaru. One seized Bralga the mother, the other young Bralga, and before the astonished Danes realised their coming, they had gone some distance along the edge of the plain. "'Bring your weapons!' roared the Malimalis in the whirlwinds to the Danes as they swirled through the camp after the enemy. The Warrawilbaru, carrying young Bralga, was ahead. The other, finding the whirlwinds were gaining on them, dropped his burden, Bralga Numbadi, and ran on. Just in front of them were two huge bala trees. Feeling that the whirlwinds, which they now knew must have spirits in them, were already lifting them from their feet. The Warrawilbaru clung to the bala trees, the one who had captured young Bralga still holding her with one arm while he grasped the tree with the other. Let the girl go, shouted the other to him. Save yourself. They shall never have her, he answered savagely. If I have to lose her, they shall not get her. Then, as the whirlwinds howled round them, tearing up everything in a wild fury, the bala trees now in their grasp, creaking and groaning, Warrawilbaru muttered a sort of incantation and released young Bralga. As she slipped from his grasp came a shout of joy from the Danes, who were just in the wake of the whirlwinds. They had their spears poised, but had been frightened to throw for fear of injuring Bralga. Now that she was free, they called aloud, Gabayul Gingni! Gabayul Gingni! but their joy was short-lived. The whirlwinds wound round the bala trees to which the Warrawilbaru clung and dragged them from the roots before the men could leave go. Up, up the whirlwinds carried the trees, the men still clinging to them, until they reached the sky. There they planted them not far from the Milky Way. And there they are still, two dark spots called Warrawilbaru, for the two cannibals have lived in them ever since being dreaded by all who have to pass along the Warrambool or Milky Way. 
Where are camped many old Danes, cooking the grubs they have gathered for food, and the smoke of their fires shows the course of the Warrambul. But only can anyone reach these fires if the Warrawilbaru are away, as sometimes happens when they go down to earth and through the medium of bullies or whirlwinds pursue their old enemies, the Danes. When the Danes saw the enemies were gone, they turned to get Bralga. Her mother was already with them. But where was young Bralga? She had not been seen to move away, yet she was gone. All round the plain they looked. They saw only a tall bird walking across it. They went to the place whence the trees had been wrenched. They scanned the ground for tracks, but saw none of Bralga going away. Only those of the big, crane-like bird now on the plain. Warrawilbaru must have seized her again and taken her after all, they said. As soon as the Mullimullies, which had animated the whirlwinds, returned from placing the Bala trees and the Warrawilbaru in the sky, the Danes asked them if they had left her there. No, Bralga, they said, had gone to the sky. Surely the Danes had seen the Warrawilbaru let her go. Then where was she? That no one could say, and none thought of asking the big bird on the plain. All mourned for Bralga, as for one dead. Her spirit, they said, would haunt the camp because they could not find her body to bury it, though they knew she must be dead, otherwise would she not return to them? They moved their camp away to the other side of the plain. After a while, they noticed that a number of birds, like the one they had seen on the plain at the time of Bralga's disappearance, came feeding round not far from their camp, and after feeding for a while, these birds would begin to corroboree. Such a strange corroboree, of which one bird, taller than the others, was seemingly a leader. This corroboree was so human, and like no movements of any other birds, like indeed nothing of the sort that the Danes had ever seen, unless it were the dancers of the lost Brolga. Out onto a clear space, the leader would lead her troop, There would be much craning of necks and bowing, pirouetting, stately measured changing of places, then gyrating with wings extended, just as Brolga had been wont to fling her arms before she madly whirled around and around, as these birds did now. Seeing which likeness, the Danes called, Brolga! Brolga! The bird seemed to understand them, for it looked towards them, then led its troop into wilder and more intricate figures of the corroboree. As time went on, the leader of the birds was seen no more, but so well had her troop learned the corroborees that they went through the same grotesque performances as in her time. The old Danes died who remembered the dancing girl Brolga, but all these dancing birds were known forever by her name. When Brolga Numbadi died, she was taken to the sky, there to live forever with her daughter Brolga, both known to us as the Clouds of Magellan, to the Danes as the Brolga. There Brolga Numbadi learned that the Warrawilbaru, by his incantation, had changed her daughter into the dancing bird, which shape she had to keep as long as she lived on earth. Afterwards, if ever the Danes saw a bully speeding along near their camp, the women would cry, Warrawilbaru! clutch their children and bury their heads in their rugs. The men would seize their weapons and hurl them at the ever-feared and hated capturers of Brolga. End of chapter 6section 7 of more australian legendary tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by avai in august 2022 more australian legendary tales by k langlow parker how the sun was made For a long time there was no sun, only a moon and stars. That was before there were men on the earth, only birds and beasts, all of which were many sizes larger than they are now. One day Dinewan, the emu, and Bralga, the native companion, were on a large plain near the Murumbiji. There they were quarrelling and fighting. Bralga, in her rage, rushed to the nest of Dinewan, 
seized from it one of the huge eggs in it which she threw with all her force up to the sky there it broke on a heap of firewood which burst into a flame as the yellow yolk spilt all over it which flame lit up the world below to the astonishment of everything on it they had only been used to the semi-darkness and were dazzled by such brightness a good spirit who lived in the sky saw how bright and beautiful the earth looked when lit up by this blaze he thought it would be a good thing to make a fire every day which from that time he has done all night he and his attendant spirits collect wood and heap it up when the heap is nearly big enough they send out the morning star to warn those on earth that the fire will soon be lit they however found this warning was not sufficient for those who slept saw it not then they thought they must have some noise made at dawn of day to herald the coming of the sun and waken the sleepers but they could not decide upon to whom should be given this office for a long time at last one evening they heard the laughter of gogor gaga the laughing jackass ringing through the air that is the noise we want they said then they told gugur gaga that as the morning star faded and the day dawned he was every morning to laugh his loudest that his laughter might awaken all sleepers before sunrise if he would not agree to do this then no more would they light the sunfire but let the earth be ever in twilight again but gugur gaga saved the light for the world and agreed to laugh his loudest at every dawn of day which he has done ever since making the air ring with his loud crackling gugur gaga gugur gaga gugur gaga when the spirits first light the fire it does not throw out much heat but in the middle of the day when the whole heap of firewood is in a blaze the heat is fierce after that it begins to die gradually away until only the red coals are left at sunset and they quickly die out except a few the spirits cover up with clouds and save to light the heap of wood they get ready for the next day children are not allowed to imitate the laughter of kugur gaga lest he should hear them and cease his morning cry if children do laugh as he does an extra tooth grows above their eye-tooth so that they carry a mark of their mockery in punishment for it for well do the good spirits know that if ever a time comes wherein the gugur gagas cease laughing to herald the sun then the time will have come when no more danes are seen in the land and darkness will reign once more end of section seven section eight of more australian legendary tales this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Beeswax Candle. More Australian Legendary Tales by K. Langlow Parker. Sturt's Desert Pea, The Blood Flower. Great was the talking in the camp one morning at the River Tribe, for during the night Wim Bacobolo had fled, taking with him Perlimil, the promised bride of Turlta. The elders sat together and planned how to capture them. While they were talking, the young men came and told them that the tracks of the fugitives were leading towards the large bulka, or lake, where was camped a hunting expedition, part of a tribe from the back country, of whom the father of Wimbakobolo had been one. Then the elders knew the fugitives must be going to take refuge with this tribe. They called the fighting men together and they said, Gather ye your weapons. We shall go to this tribe and demand that they give us the fugitives. Wimbakobolo shall we slay. Polimil shall be Turtus to slay or keep as it pleases him. Soon they went forward, after having painted themselves in full war paint and armed themselves with many weapons. For two days they followed the track. On the third day they saw the campfires. Then they sent their messengers to the tribe whose elders received them and listened to their request that Wimbakabolo and Perlimil should be given up. Do not send me back, cried Perlimil, to old Tulta. Two wives is he slain with his wadi. Let me not be the third. And she sobbed aloud. 
Cease your crying, said Wimbuckabolo. I give you up to no man. Rather would I slay you with my spear. Let Tolta, he said, turning to the elders, be a man and fight me. I am ready, but he is a coward. Men of my father's tribe who have given us shelter, who, when we were hungry, gave us food, remember that in the days that are past my father was one of you, a great warrior who slew your enemies as if they were ants, so powerful was he. Even as he fought for you, so will his son in the days to come, if you give him your aid now. Long have I loved Polimu, she with the starry eyes and her heart has been mine for ever. Can a maid at the bidding of the greybeards turn her heart to a wife-slayer, leaving the one she loves, turning from one who is young, strong and straight, to a bowed cripple? Remember my father before you despise the help of his son before you, and his grandsons to come. We shall never go back to the tribe of Tulta. Rather will I spear Perlimul, my heart's beloved, as she stands before you, and mingle my blood with hers. Wimbakobolo drew himself up, and looked so powerful and fierce a warrior as he stood, weapons in hand before the elders, that they said, Fools should we be to give up the son of our old leader to our enemies. He shall lead us, as did his father before him, and his Pelimil shall be the mother of warriors to follow him, for strong are the clan of Wimbakabolo, men like mountains, as their name tells. Then an elder turned to the messengers, saying, Let Tarota come alone out onto the plain. There Wimbakabolo will meet him, and there they can fight. If Tarota will not, then let him go back, a coward, to his country and stay there. Wimbakabolo remains with us. We shall give him up to none. Back to their tribe went the messengers, but no Turta came to accept the challenge, and back to the big river went he with the others. Wimbakabolo and Perlimu lived in peace, loved of all the tribe they had come to, for he was a mighty hunter, and she a singer of sweet songs. After a while, when the cold winds began to blow round the Bulka, the tribe moved their camp to where, on the far side, there were more trees for shelter and firewood, for the winter was at hand. Before the winter had gone, a son was born to Wimbakabolo and Perlimu, and seeing what a big baby he was, the tribe laughingly called him the Little Chief, and brought him offerings of toy boomerangs, throwing sticks, and such things to the eyes of his mother shone with pride, and the father already began to make him weapons to be used one day against the enemies of the tribe who had sheltered them. And Perlimul sang new songs, which she said the spirits taught her about her little son, whom she said was to live for ever, the most beautiful thing on the plains of the back country. Perlimul would sing her songs, and her baby would crow and laugh, and the father would say little, but bear so proud a look on his face as he glanced from his carving of weapons with an opossum's tooth, from time to time at his wife and child, that all would smile to see his happy pride, and their hearts were glad that the elders had not given up Perlimu to be the bride of Turta, the wife-slayer. The winter passed away, and with the coming of the summer, all made ready to return to their hunting ground where the fugitives had first come to them. But Perlimul sang no longer. The spirit, she said, told her that misfortune was at hand. Let us stay in the winter camp, she said to her husband, where we have been so happy. I fear we shall lose our little chief if we go. Let us stay, my husband. That cannot be my wife. All the tribe would call me a coward and say I feared to meet Tilda. Better be called a coward, which all know you are not, my husband, than lose our little chief. Dark would our lives be without him. He is the sun that brightens our days. Without him, dark as a grave would they be forever. That is true, my wife. Now he has been with us so long, life would be dreary without him, our little chief. But why should we lose him? Did not the spirits say he should live for ever on the plains? Then why should you fear for him, my loved one? I cannot tell. 
Truly, the Spirit said so. And yet they say now, as their voices come to me on every breeze, that misfortune is at hand. But not for the little chief, Perlimu, for the tribe, maybe, who sheltered us. Then how could we leave them to face it alone? Come with me bravely, mother of the little chief, lest your son drink in fear at your breast. So Perlimu hugged her child to him, and spoke no more of her fear. And as the days passed merrily in the new camp, which was the old, the fears were forgotten, and the spirits ceased their warnings. One night, when the tribe were all asleep, unwitting of danger, their enemies, who had been waiting their chance, closed in around them. Closer and closer they came, led by the crafty Tolta. Too great a coward to risk an open fight, he stole like a dingo into the camp at night, meaning to slay by treachery all who had balked him of his prey per limel. She should be slain with the rest, men, women, and children, all were to be sacrificed to his hate. He had laid his plans well, waiting till all fear of vengeance was over and all vigilance relaxed. Closer and closer they crept, making no sound as they came nearer and nearer. The little chief stirred in his sleep. Perlimel crooned him to rest again with the spirit song, telling how he should live on the plains forever, the brightest, most beautiful thing on them. Soon he was soothed, and the mother nestling closer to the ever-loved Wimbakabolo slept again unwitting of danger. A dog at their feet growled, and Wimbakabolo stirred. Again the dog growled. Wimbakabolo rose to his feet, but even as he stood up he was felled to the ground by a deadly blow from Turta, and into the camp rushed the enemy, slaying the sleepers as they lay for the most part, though some of them had time to seize their weapons, but in vain to defend themselves. Turta, who for days had known the camp of Perlimel, and claimed as his own victim her husband, having killed him, now with a fiendish yell, transfixed the body of the little chief with a jagged spear. The tongue of Perlimu, the sweet singer, clove to her mouth as she saw her husband dead beside her and her child on the spear of her enemy. Then she wrenched the spear from Dolta, and the end which had passed through the body of her baby she turned and plunged into her own heart, pinning the little chief to her and fell with him dead onto the body of her husband and the life-blood of the three mingled into one stream. Thus was accomplished the vengeance of Turta, which left not one of the tribe who had given the fugitive's shelter alive. Leaving the bodies to the hawks and crows, Turta and his tribe went back to the Kalawata. The next season they determined to hunt on the hunting grounds of their dead enemies. But when they reached them, they camped some distance away from the scene of the slaughter, lest the spirits of the dead should molest them. At night they saw strange lights moving on that spot. Then they knew that the spirits were indeed abroad. The next morning they went for water to the Bulka, or lake. How it glistened in the sun! Was it water? They paused and looked. No water was that before them. On they went, and then saw that the large lake had been turned to salt. Then the tribe were frightened and turned back to their own hunting grounds for no man likes to dare the spirits. Dorota said he would follow them, but first would he go to where bleached the bones of his enemies. It would give him joy, he said, to see them. With hatred still strong in his heart, he went. But surely, he thought, must his eyes be dazzled from the glare from the salt lake before him. For he saw no bones in the place where his enemies had been, only masses of brilliant red flowers spreading all over the scene of the massacre, flowers such as he had never seen before. As he was gazing with a dazed expression at them, there stretched down from the sky a spear with a barb that caught him in the side and lifted him from his feet. As he hung in mid-air, he heard a voice, though he saw nothing, say, Cowardly murderer of children and women, how dare you set foot on the spot made sacred forever by the blood that you spilt, the blood of the little chief, his mother and father, which flowed in one stream and blossomed as you see it now. 
for no man can kill blood, for more than the life of the flesh is in blood. Their blood shall live forever, making beautiful with its blazing brightness the bare plains where are the salt lakes, the dried tears of the spirits whose songs Perlimal sang so sweetly, the salt tears which they shed when you and such as you poured out the lifeblood of their loved tribe. Here shall you sit forever before your handiwork, the work of a coward. So saying, the spirit transfixed Tulta to the ground, leaving the spear still through him. There in the course of ages man and spear turned to stone as an everlasting monument of the spirit's power, and there at Tulta's feet spread the beautiful red flower, the glory of the western plains where the salt lakes are, Sturt's Desert Pea, as we call it, but to the old tribes it was known as the Flower of Blood. End of section 8section 9 of more australian legendary tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org more australian legendary tales by k langlow parker piggy billa the porcupine piggy billa was getting old and not able to do much hunting for himself nor did he care so much for the flesh of emu and kangaroo as he did for the flesh of men. He used to entice young men to his camp by various devices, and then kill and eat them. At last the Dayans found out what he was doing. They were very angry, and determined to punish him. We will kill or cripple him, they said, so that he, giant though he be, shall be powerless against our people. A mob of them went and surrounded his camp. He was lying asleep, face downwards, as he did not wish his dewy or dream spirit to leave him, as it might have done had he slept on his back with his mouth exposed. In his sleep even he seemed to hear a rustling in the leaves, but suspected no evil, saying drowsily to himself, It is but the bulla bulla, or butterflies, fluttering round. Then he slept on while his enemies closed in round him. Raising their spears, with one accord they threw them at him, until his back was one mass of them sticking up all over it. Then the Dayans rushed in, and broke his arms and legs with their bundis and wagaras, crippling him indeed. As he made neither sound nor movement, they thought they had killed him, and went back, satisfied with their vengeance to the camp, meaning to return for their weapons later. As soon as the Dayans were gone, Piggy Billa crawled away on all fours to the underground home of his friend, Murga Mugwi, the spider. Down he went in through the trap door, and there he stayed until his wounds were healed. He tried to draw out the spears, but was unable to do so. They stayed in his back forever and forever he went on all fours, as his tribe have done ever since. They too, as he did, get quickly underground if in danger from enemies. When the guinea or redbreasts, of whose family Piggy Billa's wife had been one, heard what had happened to him, they lifted up their voices and sang the death wail until its melancholy sounds echoed through the bush as they rose and fell in wave-like cadences. In their grief, they cut their heads with mujil, or stone knives, and kamibus, or tomahawks, until the blood ran down, staining their breasts red, and the breasts of the guinea have been red ever since. End of section 9 Section 10 of More Australian Legendary Tales This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. More Australian Legendary Tales by K. Langdo Parker Gayardari the Platypus A young duck used to swim away by herself in the creek. 
Her tribe told her that Maloka, the water devil, would catch her some day if she were so venturesome. But she did not heed them. One day, after having swum down some distance, she landed on a bank where she saw some young green grass. She was feeding about when suddenly out rushed from a hidden place Bigoon, an immense water rat, and seized her. She struggled and struggled, but all in vain. I live alone, he said. I want a wife. Let me go, said the duck. I am not for you. My tribe have a mate for me. You stay quietly with me, and I will not hurt you. I am lonely here. If you struggle more, or try to escape, I will knock you on the head, or spear you with this little spear I always carry. But my tribe will come and fight you, and perhaps kill me. Not they. They will think Maloka has got you. But even if they do come, let them. I am ready. And again he showed his spear. The duck stayed. She was frightened to go while the rat watched her. She pretended that she liked her new life and meant to stay always, while all the time she was thinking how she could escape. She knew her tribe came to look for her, for she heard them, but Bigoon kept her imprisoned in his hole in the side of the creek all day, only letting her out for a swim at night when he knew her tribe would not come for fear of Maloka. She hid her feelings so well that at last Bigoon thought she really was content with him, and gradually he gave up watching her, taking his long day sleep as of old. Then came her chance. One day, when Bagoon was sound asleep, she slunk out of the burrow, slid into the creek, and swam away up it, as quickly as she could, towards her old camp. Suddenly she heard a sound behind her. She thought it must be Bagoon, or perhaps the dreaded Maloka. So, stiff as her wings were, she raised herself on them and flew the rest of the way, alighting at length very tired amongst her tribe. They all gabbled round her at once, hardly giving her time to answer them. When they heard where she had been, the old mother ducks warned all the younger ones only to swim upstream in the future, for Bagoon would surely have vowed vengeance against them all now, and they must not risk meeting him. How that little duck enjoyed her liberty and being with her tribe again! How she splashed as she pleased in the creek in the daytime, and flew about at night if she wished! She felt as if she'd never wanted to sleep again. It was not long before the laying season came. The ducks all chose their nesting places, some in hollow trees, and some in myria bushes. When the nests were all nicely lined with down feathers, the ducks laid their eggs. Then they sat patiently on them, until at last the little fluffy, downy ducks came out. Then in a little time the ducks in the trees took the ducklings on their backs, and in their bills, and flew into the water with them, one at a time. Those in the myria bushes waddled out with their young ones after them. In due course the duck who had been imprisoned by Bagoon hatched out her young too. Her friends came swimming round the myria bush she was in, and said, Come along, bring out your young ones too. Teach them to love the water as we do. Out she came, only two children after her. And what were they? Such a quacking gabble her friends set up, shrieking, What are those? My children, she said proudly. She would not show that she too was puzzled at her children being quite different from those of her tribe. Instead of downed feathers, they had a soft fur. Instead of two feet, they had four. Their bills were those of ducks, and their feet were webbed, and on the hind ones were just showing the points of a spear, like Bagoon always carried to be in readiness for his enemies. Take them away, cried the ducks, flapping their wings and making a great splash. Take them away. They are more like Bagoon than us. Look at their hind feet. 
The tip of his spear is sticking from them already. Take them away, or we shall kill them before they grow big and kill us. They do not belong to our tribe. Take them away. They have no right here. And such a row they made that the poor little mother duck went off with her two little despised children, of whom she had been so proud despite their peculiarities. She did not know where to go. If she went down the creek, Bagoon might catch her again and make her live in the burrow, or kill her children because they had webbed feet, a duck's bill, and had been hatched out of eggs. He would say they did not belong to his tribe. No one would own them. There would never be anyone but herself to care for them. The sooner she took them right away, the better. So thinking, away upstream she went until she reached the mountains. There she could hide from all who knew her and bring up her children. On, on she went until the creek grew narrow and scrubby on its banks, so changed from the broad streams which used to placidly flow between large unbroken plains that she scarcely knew it. She lived there for a little while, then pined away and died, for even her children, as they grew, saw how different they were from her and kept away by themselves, until she felt too lonely and miserable to live, too unhappy to find food. Thus pining, she soon died away on the mountains, far from her old Norumba, or hereditary hunting ground. The children lived on and throve, laid eggs, and hatched out more children just like themselves, until, at last, pair by pair, they so increased that all the mountain creeks had before long some of them. And there they still live, the Gayadari, or platypus, quite a tribe apart. For when did ever a rat lay eggs, or a duck have four feet? End of section 10《セクション11 of More Australian Legendary Tales》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Beeswax Candle. More Australian Legendary Tales by K. Langlow Parker. How Mungi, or Mussels, were brought to the creeks. One day in the far past, a Mungi Wario Warumbul. Or seagull was flying over the western plains carrying a mussel. One, the crow, saw her and, wondering what she carried, pursued her. In her fear at being overtaken, she dropped the mussel. Seeing it drop, one stopped his pursuit and swooped down to see what the strange thing was. Standing beside it, with his head on one side, he peered at it. Then he gave it a peck. He rather liked the taste of it. He pecked again and again till the fish in one side of the shell was finished. He never noticed that there was a fish in the other side too. So he took up the empty shell, as he thought, and threw it into the creek. There this mungi throve and multiplied, all that followed her being as she was, one fish enclosed between two shells. Not as the one mungi Wariwarimul had brought, which had two fish, one on each side shell. Not knowing that he had thrown a Mangi mother into the creek, Wan determined to pursue Mangi Wariwarimul and get more, or find out whence she had brought the one he had thought so good, that he might get some. Away he flew in the direction she had gone. He overtook her some miles up the creek beside a big water hole. Before she saw him coming, he had swooped down upon her, crying, Give me some more of that fish and two shells you brought. I have no more. Let me go. Tell me then where you got it, that I may get more for myself. They do not belong in your country. They live in one far away which I passed in my flight from the big salt water here. Let me go. And she struggled to free herself, crying piteously the strange, sad cry of her tribe. But one, the crow, held her tightly. If you promise to go straight back to that country and bring some more, I will release you. That you must promise, and also that when I have finished those you should bring more, that I may never be without them again. If you do not promise, I will kill you now. Let me go, and I will do as you ask. 
I promise my tribe shall help me bring Mungi to your creeks. Go then, said Wan, swiftly back and bring to me here on the banks of the creek the fish that hides itself between two shells. And he let her go, turning her head towards the south. Away she flew. Days passed and months, and yet Mungi Warwarimul did not return, and Wan was angry with himself for not having killed her rather than let her so deceive him. He went one day to the creek for a drink, and stooping, he saw before him a shell such as he had thrown into the water. Thinking it was the same, he took no notice, but going on along the creek, he saw another, and yet another. He cracked one by holding it in his beak and knocking it against the root of a tree on the bank. Then he ate the fish, and looking round for more, he found the mud along the margin of the creek was thick with them. Then not knowing that the mussel shell he had thrown away held a fish, he thought Mangi Wariwarimu must have returned unseen by him, disappearing secretly lest he should hurt her. Later he found that was not so, for one day he saw a flock of her tribe flying over where he was. They alighted a little higher up, where he saw some of them stick the mungi they were carrying in the mud, just under the water. Having done so, on they flew a little farther to stick others, and so on up the creek. Having finished their work, they turned and flew back towards the sea coast. Juan noticed that the mungi came out of the water, and opening their shells, stretched out between them, and uttered a slow, piteous, muffled, mew-like sound. Making their way along the mud, they cried as they went, for the Mangi Warubarumu to take them back to their own country. But their cries were unheeded, for far away were the seagulls. At last they reached the Mangi, which had been born in the creek. These being stronger and more numerous than the newcomers, soon altered their habits of life, teaching them to live as they did, only one fish and the two joined together shells, and so have all mussels been ever since. For though from time to time, on the rare visits of the seagulls to the back creeks, fresh mungi are brought, yet these two soon do as the others. The Dayans cook mussels in the hot ashes of their fires and eat them with relish, saying, if it had not been for Wan, we would not have had this good food, for he it was who caused it to be given to us by Mangi Wariwarimu, the Muscle Bringer. End of section 11. Section 12 of More Australian Legendary Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Beeswax Candle. More Australian Legendary Tales by K. Langlo Parker Boruna's Trip to the Sea When the two Miamie were translated to the sky from Boruna's camp, failing to recover them, he journeyed on alone. He was now a long way from the spot he had started from, which was near Narangildun. He had passed Yaraanba, Narin, and had reached Nindiguli, where the little sand ridges are, to where the Irmunan had gone from Nundu. He was camping by some water when he saw a strange creature coming towards him, having the body and head of a dog, feet of a woman, and a short tail. It bounded four or five feet in the air as it came along, making a whirring, whizzing noise with its lips. What is this coming to water? said Waruna to himself. When the creature was close, he said, It must be Irmunan. One of the pups of the dog Bayami left at Nundu that I have heard of. He called out to it. Where is your old master? For he thought he would find out if the strange creature knew where Bayami was. For answer, the Ilmunan made the spluttering, whizzing noise with his lips Waruna had already heard. Waruna said, Is he gone right away from you? Again came only the spluttering, whizzing noise a sort of pursing of the lips together and blowing out, a sound like frrr, frrr. Is it true that he is gone forever? Frrr, frrr. Again came the answer. Buruna stood up and motioned Irmunan back, saying, You go away now, that will do. I want you here no more. You tell me nothing of Bayami. At the sound of the name Bayami, Irmunan jumped away 
saying as he went, Frrr, frrr. He quickly disappeared, going back to the sand ridges, under which Oruna had heard he and the rest of the strange litter lived, in huge caves, where they imprisoned any travellers they could round up into them. Nothing frightened them but mention of the name Biami. Waruna did not mean to risk another encounter, so he hurried on to Dungur. On, on he travelled for many days, till at last he reached Dungumber, which is on the sea. Seeing a wide expanse of water before him and feeling thirsty, he took his little bingui down to dip some out and drink. Kuh, he said as he swallowed a mouthful before he realised the strange taste. Kuh, butter, butter, salt, salt, he said and he spat out what he could. He thought it must be the white froth that was salt, so he cleared this off with his hand, dipped the bingui in again, and again tasted. Kuh, kuh, butter, butter, I am thirsty. I must go back to the water holes I passed and get a drink there. Before going, he looked as far as his eye could reach across the sea. He said, What sort of flood water is this that has a tree in it nowhere? Not even a myriad bush, and it is salt, salt to taste. It does not look like flood water at all. It looks like Guna Gula, the sky with white clouds on it. Yet when the clouds move, the sky is still. All this moves and is water. Though surely man never tasted such before. Wonderingly, back he went to the water holes and quenched his thirst. Then he killed two opossums and skinned them to make water bags. Ugulimia. That night, as he camped out of sight of and some distance away from the sea, he heard its booming noise, for the wind had risen. What the noise was, he did not know. The next morning he went out to see the strange water again, thinking he might now make out a bank on the far side. Seeing a high tree a few hundred yards from the beach, he climbed up it and looked again seawards, scanning the distant horizon for trees or land. He saw only water, a dark, troubled-looking water that day. There was a thunderstorm in it. This must be the camp of Dulumai, the thunder, and the roaring winds, he said as he listened to the angry booming. That is what I heard last night. Then, as he saw the tide rising, and the waves chasing each other onto the beach, where they dashed with an angry roar, going back only to come rushing in again higher next time. He said, There must be wunder, devils, in it, and they are trying to get me. I will go up that high mountain. There shall I see better. But in vain he climbed the mountain. He saw only the strange water, as far as he could see. Water, only water. Down the mountain he went again, back to the water holes, where were hanging the opossum skins to dry. These he quickly made into water bags. He waited till he saw the strange water still as it was when he first saw it. Then he went to it and filled the bags with it. He then picked up a few shells to take away with him. He meant to go straight back to his tribe and tell them what he had seen, taking with him the bags of water, that they might taste it and know his story was true. On his return journey, he met a very old Dan. Waruna thought he might know something of this strange water and its booming voices. The old Wirinun listened to all Waruna told him. He tasted the water, spat it out again, sat silent for some time. Then he said, Surely have then my father's fathers spoken truly when they told their children that there was beyond the mountains more water than the eye of man could stretch across. Water covering a bigger plain than the eye of man has ever seen. Water which is full of dangers for man, whom it pursues to its very banks, where it rages when it cannot catch him for the many monsters which live in it, and are bigger, they say, and deadlier than couriers. Saw you any such? Nothing, said Waruna. Did I see but water, Buddha, water everywhere? But the voices of these monsters was the noise I heard, bidding the water draw me to them, and howling in rage when I got free away. I shall go swiftly to my tribe, and tell them what I have seen and heard. Before going, he gave the old Wirinun some of the salt water that his tribe might taste it. He also gave him a shell, one of those he had picked up on the beach. These shells were afterwards the cause of many fights, 
one tribe trying to get them from the other. The oldest Wirinun of the tribe always wore one of them at the great corroborees. After many generations had passed away, one Wirinun, in whose possession it was, put it for safety in his minga, or spirit tree. And to this day there are fights about it, for he died leaving it there. Some tribes try to steal it, but others fight to protect it. Every now and then on his road home, Waruna had to stay and make fresh bags to carry the salt water in, as the old ones started to leak. But at length he reached Narangladul again, with enough for the elders of his tribe to taste. None of them knew where he had been, nor could they imagine what this water was which stretched farther than all their hunting grounds. Any stranger that came to the camp was brought to Waruna, that he might hear from him what had turned him back on his journey. But Waruna did not live long to tell his story. What he had seen became a tradition in his tribe. He had broken the law of Biami by leaving his own hunting ground, and so was not allowed to live long after his return. Yet so famous was he from his far journeyings, that when he died, followed by a terrific crash, a huge meteor shot across the sky, thereby telling the tribes for miles around that a great spirit had passed from the earth. From generation to generation was told the story of Baruna's journey and the strange water he had seen, and at the big corroborees were seen the shells he had brought. At length the Wunda, or white devils, came to live in the country, and the truth of the old tradition was proved by some black boys who went down from Gunda Blui with cattle to Mulumbimba. There they saw the widely stretching water with the white clouds on it. There they heard its booming roar. They were terrified. But one boy, more venturesome than the others, said, Let us taste it. If it is salt, then in truth this is like the water the old men tell us Waruna saw. They tasted it. It was salt. It is true, they said, that which they told us. We will tell them that we too have seen it and have tasted it, and we will take back some of these wa'a to wear at the corroborees. So back to the tribes, they took the shells to prove their story. One of those boys... The first who tasted the salt water is an old man now. He it is who told me the story of Waruna's trip to the sea. End of section 12. Section 13 of More Australian Legendary Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. More Australian Legendary Tales by K. Langlo Parker Walubal, the Bark Lizard Every day while the little camp children were playing and their parents were away hunting, a strange little boy used to come to the camp. He was only a little boy, about six or seven years old. Every afternoon, after having played for some time with the other children, he would run away from them, go round the different darders, and steal food out of them all, taking anything edible he could find. When the children saw him thus helping himself, they called out, don't touch our mother's things. He did not heed them, but took what he wanted. The children used to try and get what he took back. But when they came near to him, he shot up suddenly, taller and taller, far out of their reach. Having thus startled them into leaving him alone, he would escape to his own camp, the whereabouts of which no one knew. At last, the parents began to notice how much of their food was taken during their absence, and they said angrily to their children, You eat all our food! No, they said, we do not. It is a little boy who comes while you are away. He comes along that track in the scrub. The parents said, Tomorrow we will wait for him and see if you are telling the truth for it would be a strange little boy who could steal all the food we miss every day. 
Accordingly, the next day, the parents hid themselves in their humpies instead of going out as usual. The children played about, watching for the little boy. When they saw him coming, one of them ran and told the parents. While Lubal, after playing for a little while as usual, went to the first humpy and sat down, looking round for what he might take. After he had rested a few minutes, he helped himself to some food and was then moving on to the next humpy. But before he had time to go as many steps, out the men and women rushed, yelling at him and brandishing boomerangs and boondies, which they soon threw at him. But to their surprise, even as their children had said, up he shot, growing taller and taller, while their weapons fell harmlessly around him. Seizing more, they threw another shower at him, aiming higher up, but he grew taller and taller, still unhurt. Then, dropping their remaining boomerangs and boondies, they caught hold of their spears and threw these with deadly force at him. As the spears pierced him, Walubal fell dead. As they saw him lying there, the Dayans said, He was our enemy, stealing our food. No need to bury him. We will only cover him with bark and change our camp. This they did, and long afterwards they saw creep from under the bark a little lizard, and they called it Walubal, because they said it must be the spirit of the boy they had killed. And ever since then, the little bark lizard has been called Walubal. End of chapter 13. Read by Carrie Adams, your book voice, at Mesa, Arizona, on the 8th of August, 2022. Section 14 of More Australian Legendary Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Prajakta. More Australian Legendary Tales by K. Langlo Parker. Gulaya Lee, the Pelican. At one time, the Dians had no fishing nets. Nor then had they the stone fisheries which Bami afterwards made for them, the best model of which is still to be seen at Breverina. In order to catch fish in those days, they used to make a wall of polygonum and grass mixed together across the creek, then go above it and drive the fish down to it, catching them with their hands against the break or wall or they would put these breaks across a maboon or small tributary of the main creek as a flood was going down and as the water ran out of the maboon, fish would be caught in numbers in the break. Gulayali, the pelican, a great verinum, was the first seen with a net, but where he had obtained it from or where he kept it, no one knew for a long while. When he wanted to fish, he used to tell his children to go and get sticks for the ends of the net that they might go fishing. But where is the net? It will be here when you come back. You do what I tell you. Get the sticks. Frightened to ask more, the children went to break the sticks, which Gulaya Lee said must be of Yura, a drooping shrub growing on the banks of the creeks, or near swamp oak scrub. This shrub bore masses of large cream bell-shaped flowers spotted with brown beautiful to look at but sickening to smell. Where no deal grew this shrub was used in place of that sacred tree. When the children brought back the Yura sticks, there on the ground in front of their father was the big fishing net, 10 or 12 feet long and 4 or 5 feet wide. Beside it was a small smoke fire of burta twigs onto which 
Gulaya Li now threw some of the yura leaves and when the smoke was thick, he held the net in it. Then taking the net with them, down they all went into the water, where two men with the net, through the ends of which were the yura sticks, went downstream to a shallow place, where they stationed themselves one at each end of the net, stretched across the creek between them. The others went upstream and splashed about to frighten the fish down to the net in which some were soon caught. When they had enough, they would come out, make fires and cook the fish. Every fishing time, the tribe puzzled over the question as to how and where Gulayali had obtained this valuable net and as to where he kept it, for after each fishing time, he took it away and no one saw it again until they went fishing. His wife and children said he never took it to his humpy. One day, the children thought that when they were sent for the Ura sticks, some of them would hide and watch where their father did get this net from. They saw him when he thought they were safely out of sight, began to twist his neck about and wriggle as if in great pain. They thought he must be very ill and were just coming out from their hiding place when all of a sudden he gave a violent wriggle, contorting himself until his neck seemed to stretch to an immense length. The children were too frightened at his appearance to move. They stayed where they were, speechless, huddled together, their eyes fixed on their father, who gave another convulsive movement and then, to their amazement, out through his mouth he brought forth the fishing net. So that was where he kept it, inside himself. The children watched him drawing it out until it all lay in a heap in front of him. Then down he sat beside it, apparently none the worse to await their return. The children who had been hiding ran to meet the others, whom they told what they had seen. They were so excited at their discovery that they talked much about it and soon the secret hiding place of the net was a secret no longer, but as yet no one knew how it was made. At last, Gulay Ali grew tired of having to produce his net so often, for the fame of this new method of fishing had spread throughout the country. Even strange tribes came to see the wonderful net. He told the people to do as he had done and make nets for themselves. Then he told them how to do it. They were to strip off murumin or nungak bark, take off the hard outside part, then chew the softer part and work it into twine, with which they could make the nets. Though he only, he said, swallowed the fiber and it worked itself up into a net inside him. But that was because he was a great Viranan. Others could not do so. After that, all the tribes made fishing nets, but only the tribe of Gulayalli could work the fiber inside them into nets, which the pelicans do to this day, the Dayans say. And the Dayans tell you that if you watch the Gulayalli or pelicans fishing, you will see that they do not dip their beaks straight down as do other fish catching birds. The pelicans put their heads sideways and then dip their long pouched bills as if they were going to draw a net. Into these pouches go the fish they catch and thence down into their nets, which they still carry inside them. Though they never bring them out now, as in the days of Gulayali, the great fishing Verenan who gave all his tribe the deep pouches which hang on to their long yellow bills to use instead of the net which each carries inside him. Though these are very miniature editions of the original Gulayhalli's net, but yet big enough to let the tribe still bear his name, which means one having a net. End of chapter 14「Section 15 of More Australian Legendary Tales」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Smithies. More Australian Legendary Tales by K. Langlo Parker. Mungungali the Iguana and Uyubului the Black Snake. When the animals were first on the earth, they were very much bigger than they are now. In those days, the bite of a snake was not poisonous, but that of an iguana was. Mungungali, the largest kind of iguana, which even now in its comparatively dwarfed condition measures five feet or so from tongue to tail, was, by reason of his poisonous bite, quite a terror in the land. His favourite food was the flesh of blackfellas, whom he used to kill in numbers. Such havoc had he wrought amongst them that at last all the other tribes held a meeting to discuss how best to check this wholesale slaughter. Many things were suggested, but nothing that seemed likely to be effective. The meeting was breaking up. The tribes could think of no plan to save their relations, the Dayans. Just as they were dispersing came Uyubului to the watering place. He asked what the meeting was about. Dinewan, the emu, told him that Mungungali was so merciless towards the Dayans or blackfellas, living almost entirely on their flesh, that they feared the race would soon be exterminated if something were not done to stop it. And, said Bora, the kangaroo, though some of us are as big and bigger, as strong and stronger than Mungungali, if we went to fight him, he would kill us with the poison he carries in a hidden bag, and we too should die, even as our relations, the Dayans, do. Most of us have relations among the Dayans, and we do not wish to see them all killed. Yet we know not how to stop the slaughter. I too have relations among them, the Hippie and the Kumbu. My relations must be saved, said Uyubului. But how? said the others. We are nearly all their relations. Mungungali himself is there and my relation, said Mudai, the opossum. But that does not stop him from slaying them, whether they are our relations, the Murrays and the Gubbies, or others, he slays all alike. I tell you that I shall save the Dayans from Mungungali, said Uyubului. But how? said the others in chorus. That I tell to none. But he, the sun, shall not go to her rest tomorrow before I shall have got that poison bag from Mungungali. Ye, the sun, shall not have hidden behind that clump of Yaran trees before you lie dead from the poison Mungungali carries if you fight against him. Did I talk of fighting? Is there no way to gain your end but by fighting? Let those who fight die. I shall not fight him, and I shall live. No Mungungali shall kill me. So saying, away glided Uyubului through the trees surrounding the waterhole where the tribes had met. When he was gone, the others talked of him and his boasting for a while. Then they all dispersed, having agreed to meet again at the same place when he, the sun, was sinking to rest the next evening. Uyubului went his way alone, pondering over his plans. Cunning, he knew, must be his guide to victory. Not otherwise could he hope to gain it, for Mungungali was bigger than he was, stronger, quicker of hearing and quicker to move, and above all, the hidden bag of poison was his. The only advantage that Uyubului thought he had was that Mungungali had been invincible so long that he might have grown careless and unsuspicious. Uyubului decided he would wait until Mungungali was gorged with his favourite food. He would then follow him until he saw him go to sleep after his feast. That would be the next day. Having thus decided, Uyubului went near Mungungali's camp and lay down to sleep there. The next morning, he watched Mungungali sally out. He followed him at a distance, saw him surprise three day ends one after the other, and kill them all, then sit down and eat his favourite parts, taking some of the flesh afterwards back to his camp with him. Uyubului followed him, saw him sit down and eat more, then roll over and go to sleep. Now is my chance, 
thought Uyubului as he crept into the camp. He was just going to raise his bundi to crack the skull of Mungungali when he thought, but first I might as well find out where he keeps and how he uses the poison. If I had it, I could soon make myself feared of all the tribes as he is. Thus thinking, he sat down to wait until Mungungali awoke. He did not have long to wait. Mungungali slept but restlessly. Feeling something was near, he awoke, sat up and looked round. At a little distance away, he saw Uyubului. As he was making a rush at him, Uyubului called out, Take care! If you kill me, you will hear nothing of the plot the tribes have planned against you, of which I have come to warn you. What plot? What can the tribes do against me? Have I killed numbers of the biggest tribe to be frightened now of the others? If you knew their plot, you would have no need to fear them. Knowing it not, your life is in danger. Then tell it to me. So I mean to do. But you were going to kill me, though I had not harmed you. Why then should I save your life? If you do not tell me, I shall surely kill you. Then you will be killed yourself, for no one else will warn you. Tell me the plot, Uyubului, and your life is spared, and the lives of your tribe forever. How do I know that you will keep your word? You will promise much, but how do I know that you will fulfil your promise? Ask of me what pleases you, and I will give it to you, to show I mean what I say. Then while I tell you the plot that threatens you, give me your hidden poison bag to hold. Then only shall I feel safe. Then only shall I tell you what was planned at the waterhole where the tribes meet to drink, where all said the Dayan should be saved and your end assured, and surely it will be so if you do not know their plans. Mungungali asked Uyubului to name some other boon, and surely he would grant it, but his hidden poison bag would he give to none. That is the way. You ask me to name what I want, I do so. You cannot grant it, so be it. Keep your poison bag. I will keep my plot. And he moved as if to go. Stay, cried Mungungali, who was determined to hear the plot at all risks. Then let me hold the poison bag. Mungungali tried to induce Uyubului to make other terms, but in vain. So he gave in. Reaching into his mouth, he drew the hidden poison bag out. Then he tried to frighten Uyubului from taking it by saying, The touch of it will poison one not used to handle it. I will put it beside me while you tell the plot against me. You will not do what I ask? I will go. And he turned away. Not so, not so, cried Mungungali. Here, take it. Assuming as indifferent an air as he could, Uyubului took the bag and went back with it to his old place on the edge of the camp. Now, quickly, tell me the plot, said Mungungali. It was this, said Uyubului, putting the poison bag into his own mouth, then going on, it was this. One of the tribes was to get this bag from you and so take away your power to harm the Dayans in the future. I vowed to do so before ye, the sun, went to her rest tonight. Not by strength could I do it, nor by strength did I try to do it. Cunning I brought with me, and cunning has done it. Back I go now to tell the tribes." And before Mungungali had time to realise how he had been tricked, Uyubului was gone. After him went Mungungali, but his meal had been heavy. He only caught Uyubului up in time to hear him tell the tribes that as he had said, so had he done. Give us then the poison bag that we may destroy it, they said. Not so, said Uyubului. None of you could get it. It is mine alone. I shall keep it. Then you shall never live in our camp. I shall come as I please to your camps. Then we shall slay you. You are not as big as is Mungungali. But I have the poison bag. Whosoever interferes with me, surely shall he die. And away went Uyubului with the poison bag, 
leaving Mungungali to tell the tribes how he had been tricked. Ever since then, the snakes have been poisonous, and not the iguanas, and there has been a feud between the snakes and the iguanas, who never meet without fighting. But though the snakes have the poison bag, they are powerless to injure the iguanas with it. For Mungungali was a great Wirinan, and he knew of a plant which, if eaten after snake bite, made the poison powerless to kill or injure. Directly an iguana is bitten by a snake, he rushes to this plant, and eating it, is saved from any evil consequences of the bite. This antidote has ever since been the secret of the iguana tribe, left in their possession by the Mungungali who lost his poison bag by the cunning of Uyubului, the black snake. End of section 15section 16 of more australian legendary tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by prajakta more australian legendary tales by k langlaw parker vayambe the turtle and wogun the turkey vayambe the turtle was the wife of Gau Gau Gaga, the laughing jackass. They had a quarrel when the time came for Vayambe to lay her egg. She was going as her tribe did to the sand beside the creek, there to make a hole and deposit them. But Gau Gau Gaga said that was a mad thing to do. A flood might come and wash them away. She should lay the eggs in a hollow tree. Vayambe said, How shall I get into a hollow tree? And even if I did get there, how should I get sand up to cover the eggs? And how would the sun shine on the sand to heat it and hatch them out? How was I born and my mother before me? Asked Gogo Gaga, answering her question with another, going on, My wife can do surely as our mothers did. I am a Vayambe, and it is right only for me to do as the Vayambes do. Does a child not take its name from its mother? My children will be Vayambe even as I am. I shall go to my own tribe. Straight went Vayambe to the creek where her tribe lived. Into the water she went after them. Gogo Gaga followed her to the edge. Then he turned back and sent his servant Wonga the pigeon and Dumer the wife of Wonga after Vayambe. Wonga sent Dumer on to tell Vayambe to come back. But Vayambe said, No, I will not go back. Let him come himself if he wants me. Wonga and Dumer went back and told this to Gaugau Gaga, who went as his wife had asked for him. But on the bank of the creek, he saw the mother of Vayambe, so he turned back, for the law of the tribes did not let him speak to his mother-in-law. He sent Wonga to consult her. Tell him, said Vayambe, the mother, My daughter will not go back. He would have her break the laws of her tribe. She shall not leave her people. Wonka went back to tell Gogo Gaga. Just as he was beginning to do so, out from the grass crept behind him, Aubyu Bululi, the black snake, an old lover of Vayambe, who was so enraged at this messenger, wanting to bring his old love back to the husband she had left that he meant to kill him. He was in the act of making a spring onto Wonga to throttle him when Gogo Gaga saw him. Gogo Gaga made one dart and was on the back of Aubyu Bululi. Clutching hold of him, he flew high in the air, up, up, as far as his flight let him go. Then he loosened his hold of Aubyu Bululi and let him drop swiftly, third to the earth, his back broken. Down after him flew Gagao Gaga. There in his camp, he saw his enemy lying dead. Twice have you tried to injure me, and twice have you failed. He said, Once when you wanted to marry Vayambe, who was promised to me, and now when you wanted to kill my faithful servant, sneaking as you did like a coward behind him. But instead of him, 
you yourself lie dead powerless forever to harm me so shall i kill ever your treacherous tribe against whom my people shall have dulle mulle lulan or vengeful hatred forever ah but it is good to see you my enemy lying there and gaugau ka ga laughed long and loud peals of laughter until the whole creek side echoed with his startling go go ka ga go go ka ka startling indeed was the sound of vayambe for her husband had always looked too solemn to laugh except when he had to herald the sunrise she hurried out of the water and went away along the opposite bank as fast as she could she thought as peal after peal of his strange loud laughter reached her that her husband had gone mad and if he caught her would kill her so near the laughter sounded that she fancied he was pursuing her she did not dare to look round but sped swiftly on but instead of following her gaugau gaga was eating his enemy and vowing again that so long as his tribe lived so long should they wage war against the tribe avyu bului killing and eating them while this feast of her old lover was going on vayambe was putting an immense distance between herself and her old camp at length she was too tired to go farther where she rested was a nice sandy place beside the creek here she decided to camp she made a hole and laid her eggs in it in due course when the last was laid and she was carefully covering them up ready for the hatching she heard a sound on the bank above her looking up she saw there a dark feathered bird with a red head and neck peering down at her who on seeing her look up said why do you cover your eggs up that the sand and sun may hatch them but won't you sit on them yourself no indeed why should i do that they will be warm where they are and come out even as i came out in the right time if i sat on them i might break them and who would get me food i should die and they too the red headed bird which was wogun the brush turkey went back to where her mate was feeding and told him what she had seen she said she would like to try that plan it seemed much easier than having to sit on the eggs week after week her mate told her not to be in a hurry to change her ways each tribe had its own custom then the vayambe might be only fooling her they would wait and see if the eggs came out all right but even so he would not have her make a nest near the creek where a sudden rise might wash it away they must stick to their scrub at length time proved that what vayambe had said was true the little vayambe all came out and were strong and well then the wogun's decided they would try and hatch their eggs without sitting on them they could not dig a hole to lay them in but they scratched up a heap of mixed debris earth sand leaves and sticks then the mother wogun every second day laid an egg until in the mound were 15 all apart from each other with the thin end downwards over these they put some more decayed leaves and rubbish and outside all a heaped up covering of more leaves and twigs when all this was done the parents waited anxiously for the result as time went on the mother bird grew restless what if she had killed or her young just to save herself she first round the big mound which stood some feet high she put her head in to feel if it were warm drew it out quickly delighted to find the nest was absolutely hot then she began to fear it would be too hot full of anxiety she scratched away the earth and leaves thinking the covering was too much she stopped suddenly and listened was that a baby bird note she listened again it was she called to her mate he came and when she told him what she had heard he scratched away until to their joy out came the finest chicks they had ever seen quite independent and strong with feet and wings more advanced than any seen on their chicks before 
proud of the success of her plan and anxious to spread the good news the mother wagoon ran away from her family to tell all her tribe about them the next season the other wagoons added to the size of the mound and many of the mothers laid their eggs in one nest until at last the whole tribe adopted the same plan thus earning for themselves the name of mound builders end of section 16section 17 of more australian legendary tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by beeswax candle more australian legendary tales by k langlo parker where the frost comes from the miamie or pleiades once lived on this earth they were seven sisters, remarkable for their beauty. They had long hair to their waists, and their bodies sparkled with icicles. Their father and mother lived among the rocks, away on some distant mountain, staying there always, never wandering about as their daughters did. When the sisters used to go hunting, they never joined any other tribes, though many tried from time to time to make friends with them. One large family of boys, in particular, thought them so beautiful that they wished them to stay with them and be their wives. These boys, the Barai Barai, used to follow the Miamie around, and, watching where they camped, used to leave their offerings for them. The Barai Barai had great skill in finding the nests of bees. First they would catch a bee and stick some white down or a white feather with some gum on its back between its hind legs. Then they would let it go and follow it to its nest. The honey they found they would put in wirries and leave at the camps of the Miamie, who ate the honey but listened not to the wooing. But one day old Waruna stole two of the girls, capturing them by stratagem. He tried to warm the icicles off them, but only succeeded in putting out his fire. After a term of forced captivity, the two stolen girls were translated to the sky. There they found their five sisters stationed, with them they have since remained, not shining quite so brightly as the other five, having been dulled by the warmth of Waruna's fires. When the Barai Barai found that Miamie had left this earth forever, they were inconsolable. Maidens of their own tribe were offered to them, but as they could not have the Miamie, they would have none. Refusing to be comforted, they would not eat, and so pined away and died. The spirits were sorry for them, and pleased with their constancy, so they gave them too a place in the sky, and there they are still. Orion's sword and belt we call them, but to the Dans they're still known as Barai Barai, the boys. The Dans say the Barai Barai still hunt the bees by day and at night dance corroborees, which the Miamie sing for them. For though the Miamie stay in their own camp at some distance from the Barai Barai, they are not too far away for their songs to be heard. The Dans say, too, that the Miamie will shine ever as an example to all women on earth. At one time of the year, in remembrance that they once lived on earth, the Miamie break off some ice from themselves and throw it down. When on waking in the morning, the Dans see ice everywhere, they say, The Miamie have not forgotten us. They have thrown some of their ice down. We will show we remember them, too. And they take a piece of ice and hold it to the septum of the noses of such children who have not already had theirs pierced. When the septums are numb with the cold, they are pierced, and a straw or bone placed through them. Now, said the Dayans, these children will be able to sing as the Miamie sing. A relation of the Miamie was looking down at the earth when the two sisters were being translated to the sky. When he saw how the old man from whom they had escaped ran about blustering and ordering them down again, he was so amused at Waruna's discomfiture and glad at their escape that he burst out laughing and has been laughing ever since, being still known as the Dandii Gindamayalyanya, the laughing star to the Dayans, to us as Venus. When thunder is heard in the winter time, the Dayans say, There are the Miamie bathing again. 
That is the noise they make as they jump, doubled up into the water, when playing bull bar lame, for whoever makes the loudest flop wins the game, which is a favourite one with the earth people too. When the noise of the bull bar lame of the Miami is heard, the Dayans say too, soon rain will fall, the Miami will splash the water down, it will reach us in three days. End of section 17. Section 18 of More Australian Legendary Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. More Australian Legendary Tales by K. Langlow Parker. Bubber, the giant brown and yellow snake. Bootha, the lissom and soft-eyed, was promised to Murray, the swift in pursuit of game, and the time was at hand when he could claim her, for he was now coming back from Abura. Back from the tests of courage, back as a brave of his tribe, back with a right to marry back to disappointment back to despair for first to meet him was gabi the father of bootha first to tell him the news of bootha his promised one told how she had been hunting for honey how she had come to the nest of a bubber whence she had taken some eggs, bringing them even into the camp. How, just as those who knew of the danger rebuked her for touching these, gliding into their midst had come the mammoth snake, Bubber. Past them all, straight to Bootha went Bubber, coiled his form round hers, crushing the life from her. Then swiftly went he as he had come, leaving Bootha, the lissom and soft-eyed, lifeless before them. Am I in time for the burial? said Murray. Three times has ye slept since we buried her, said Gabi. Then she is even now traveling towards Wibulu, the heaven of women. I shall be swift to follow her. The deal twigs are yet green on her path. I shall snatch her yet from Wibulu. Think you, said Gubby scornfully, that she who was murdered will follow one who has not avenged her? Then Murray paused from slaying himself as he stood, and he said, There is wisdom in your words, O Gubby father of she who is lost. I shall first slay Bubber, the snake demon. Thus saying, Murray turned to the camp of his tribe. The days passed, and Bootha was still unavenged. But Murray never forgot her, nor did he cast one glance on the comeliest of maidens. His heart was with Bootha in Weebulu. His mind was bent on revenge. He went hunting with two of his tribe. At length he saw what he wished for ahead of him. A nest of the bubbers was there. He did not run straight to attack it, as his molehers expected, but went back with them to the camp. Come, he said to his tribe, come and let us gather the gum of Mabu. He told them then why he spoke so, and seeing his reason was good, they followed him. Having gathered the gum in plenty, they carried it back to their camp. Next day they went with Murray, and at his bidding broke down the branches of trees some distance from the nest of the bubbers. With these branches they made platforms on the boughs of some trees which he showed them. 
they went on to these platforms, and the noise they made was great. Hearing which, out came the snakes, the mammoth bubbers. Murray and the Dayans had been careful that no shadow of theirs should fall on the ground. They knew well that the bite of even their shadows by a bubber would kill them. As the bubbers came nearer and nearer, the Dayans made ready pieces of gum, gum of the mabu, about the size of a pigeon's egg, to throw at their mouths. Snap with the jaws of the bubbers at them. Another pellet of gum was thrown. Snap! and the jaws, the jaws of death, were closed, held fast by the gum between them. The murderous bubbers were mastered. Murray, the avenger, had conquered. Seeing the scheme had worked as they wished, the Dayans returned to their camp. There they waited patiently, returning in due time to the scene of their gum-throwing. They were laden with wood, for they expected to find their enemies dead, and the flesh of bubbers was good. Great was the joy of Murray when he saw the gum had stuck their jaws fast, and that the bubbers were all dead. His hand was swift to raise his komibu and sever their heads from their bodies. Swift, too were the Dayans in lighting fires for cooking the bubbers. Scarce have bubbers been in the land since Bootha, the lissom and soft-eyed, was avenged by the cunning of Murray, the swift to hunt game. Though their name carries terror yet to its hearer, their size has grown with the time, and fear has stretched their measurements until even the strongest and wariest feel a tremor when the name of the brown and yellow bubber is mentioned. End of chapter 18 Read by Kerry Adams Your Book Voice at Mesa, Arizona on the 8th of August, 2022「Section 19 of More Australian Legendary Tales」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Beaks Wax Candle « More Australian Legendary Tales » by K. Langlo Parker The Yueya Mayama, or Stone Frogs a family of girls once so offended an old Wirinun that one day, when they were out hunting in the bush, he turned them all into yuaya, or frogs. When days passed, and they did not return, their mother and relations thought they had been stolen by men of a strange tribe. Rain had come before there was any alarm about their absence, so all tracks were washed out, except the track of the Udule or round rain-making stone, which had been abroad, as it always was, in muddy weather. This stone had the spirits of past rain-makers in it, and could move about as its tracks proved. Also, when it was making itself a new camp before rain, it could be heard laughing with joy in anticipation of the mud to come. No one was ever seen to touch the Udule, yet its changes of camp were frequent. Though some days had passed since they were missed, the mother of the girls still hoped to find them, thinking they might have seen the rain coming and built themselves a shelter in the bush, remaining there until it was over. She went in the direction they had gone, and called aloud to them. There came an answering call. On she sped to whence it seemed to come, and called again. Again came an answer from close beside her. She looked around, but saw no one. Again she called. There came an answer from a tussock of grass at her feet. Then she knew she had only heard the cry of the Nuragogo, the orange and blue beetle, which could always answer thus in Nungabara in the bush when one of that tribe was alone. She gave up hope of finding her daughters, and being weak and hungry, she looked around for food. 
Soon, she saw some tracks of Yuaya, or earth frogs, and finding where they were, she began to dig them out. Fine, large Yuaya they were, the largest she had ever seen. What a feed I shall have, she said aloud. It came a startlingly melancholy cry from the frogs, who seemed to be gazing fixedly at her. But taking no notice, she went on, I think I shall eat them here. I am very hungry, and if I take them to the camp, the others will want some. She stooped to pick them up, but such a crying came as surely never frogs made before, and so piteously they looked at her that she began to feel there was something strange about these frogs, and she dropped the one she held in her hand. But I am stupid, she said, to take notice of a frog's cry. I would be mad to leave such a good feed here. And again she stooped to pick them up. Again came their croaking cries intensified, and the cries seemed to frame themselves into the words. You must not eat us. You are our mother. We are the girls you lost. The old Wirinun changed us into frogs because we but laughed at the ma of his tribe saying the back of it, the back of the emu, was humped as was his. You cannot eat us. And loud was the croaking, and so frightened was the woman that she turned and sped quickly through the bush back to the camp with a mournful cry still ringing in her ears, and a vision of the piteous eyes ever before her. She went straight to the old Wirinun and said, did you change my girls into Yuya, which are crying now even in the bush? I did so, said he, quite proud the woman had seen proof of his power. Why did you do so? Why should you leave me to grow old with no daughter to care for me? Did you not choose their father rather than me? Why should I think of you now? Let their father change them again. Surely he is more powerful than I since you chose him before me. I am but a humped-backed one, so your girl said, even as they said my ma was, the dinner one. Well, you must know that to scoff at the ma of a man is to make war with his tribe, yet I war not. I but turn your daughters into such as have voices which none heed. No more can they scoff at the back of a dinner one. Go, woman, eat them. You are ya is food that is good. So he taunted the woman who once in her youth had scorned him. How should I, a mother, eat her young? What talk is that you make? But alas, surely another will find them and eat them. Only you can save them. Change them again, I pray you, so that none can eat them. Never again shall they scoff at a dinner one. Never again will I scorn you. I will come to your dardur for ever. Why should I take you to my dardur now you are old, when you came not young? And he turned away going on with the carving he was making on a boomerang with an opossum's tooth. Change, oh, change them, I pray you, so that none can eat them. I will give you the duri, or grunting dayul, of my father's 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 to be yours forever. No one but its rightful owner can use it, for does it not grunt when a stranger touches it? This stone, which of old belonged to the Wirinuns of my father's tribe, I will give you the stone which alone of all Dayurls has a voice. Bring me the Dori, said the Wirinun, and I promise to change your girls so that they shall never be eaten. The woman brought the magical stone of her forefathers, her greatest possession, which grunted as she laid it at the Wirinun's feet. Now go, said the Wirinun, into the bush. There you will find your daughters, and find I have kept my promise. Even now they are so that surely no one could eat them. Back on her tracks went the woman to where she had seen the Yuya. Hopefully she went expecting to see her daughters again, but when she reached the place there were the frogs still. Oh, my daughters, my daughters, shall I never see you more as you once were? And she wailed aloud as if mourning the dead. But no answer came from the Yuya, nor did they look towards her. Wailing, she stooped to pick one up. The Wirinun tricked me, she said. Surely, indeed, no one will ever eat them. 
for they are turned to stone. And so it was. Some were of plain grey stone, and some with a stripe of green on them, just as the frogs had been marked. Her daughters would be stone frogs for ever, as were the frogs that Burungunulu and Kunombilye had dug and left for cooking before they took that fatal plunge into the spring Kauragul, whence the couriers took them down the Naran, and whether Bayami followed them after changing the food they had gathered into stones to mark the spot forever. And there at the spring were the stone frogs still, as the mother knew, and now she saw their fellow in these the Wirinun had changed, these who had once been her girls, but now were Yuya Mayama. End of section 19「the faraway land of rest, beyond the top of the Ubi Ubi mountain, all the flowers that grew on the wogis or plains, on the murilas or ridges, and all the flowers that grew on the trees, withered and died. None grew again in their place. The earth looked bare and desolate, with no flowers to brighten it. That there had ever been any became but a tradition, which the old people of the tribes told to the young ones. As the flowers were gone, so were the bees. In vain the women took their virids out to fill with honey, they always returned without it. In all the length of the land, there were but three trees where the bees still live and work, and these the people did not dare to touch. For Bami had put his ma or brand on them, claiming them thus as his own forever. The children cried for honey, and the mothers murmured because the Viranans would not let them touch the trees by Bami, which were sacred from all forever. When the all seeing spirit saw, though the tribe hungered for honey, yet did they not touch Bami's trees, he told him of their obedience. Bami was pleased and said he would send them something which, when, as now, the land was perished with a drought, should come on the bibil and gulaba trees, giving a food as sweet to the taste of the children as honey. Soon were seen white sugary specks on the leaves of the bibil, which the Dians called gunbin, and then came the clear valir, or manna, running down the trees like honey, to pile into lumps which stiffened on the forks of the branches, or sometimes fell to the ground whence the children gathered and ate it when they could not reach the branches. The hearts of the people were glad as they ate gratefully the sweet food sent them. But still, the Viranans greatly longed to see the earth covered again with flowers, as before the going of Bami. So great grew the longing that they determined to travel after him and ask that the earth might again be made beautiful. Telling the tribes nothing of where they were going, they sped away to the northeast. On and on they journeyed until they came to the foot of the great Ubi Ubi mountain, which towered high above them until they lost sight of its top in the sky. Steep and unscalable looked its sides of sheer rock as they walked along its base. But at length they espied a foothold cut in a rock another and yet another, and looking upward, they saw a pathway of steps, cut as far as they could see. Up this ladder of stone they determined to climb. On they went, and when the first day's climb was ended, the top of the mountain still seemed high above them, and even so at the end of the second and third day, for the route was circuitous and long, but on the fourth day they reached the summit. There they saw a stone excavation into which bubbled up a spring of fresh water from which they drank thirstily and found it so invigorated them 
as to make them lose all feeling of weariness which had previously almost prostrated them they saw at a little distance from the spring circles of piled up stones they went into one of these and almost immediately they heard the sound of a gandhi the medium through which wala gurun buan's voice was heard wala gurun buan was the spirit messenger of yami he asked the virenans what they wanted there where the sacred lore of yami was told to such as came in search of knowledge they told him how dreadly the earth had looked since yami had left it how the flowers had all died and never bloomed again and do bami had sent the valer or manna to take the place of the long missed honey yet they launched to see again the flowers making the earth gay as once it had been the wala gurumbuan ordered some of the attendant spirits of the sacred mountain to lift the virenans into bulima where fadeless flowers never cease to bloom of these the virenans might gather as many as they could hold in their hands then the spirits would lift them back into the sacred circle on the summit of ubiubi whence they must return as quickly as possible to their tribes as the voice ceased the virenans were lifted up through an opening in the sky and set down in the land of beauty flowers blooming everywhere in such luxuriance as they had never seen before massed together in lines of brilliant coloring looking like hundreds of elvirees rainbows laid on the grass so overcome were the virenans that for some moments they could only cry but the tears were tears of joy remembering what they had come for they stooped and gathered quickly their hands full of the various blossoms the spirits then lifted them down again into the stone circle on the top of ubiubi there sounded again the voice of the gandhi and bulagurumbuan said tell your tribes when you take them these flowers that never again shall the earth be bare of them all through the seasons a few shall be sent by the different winds but yarange mare shall bring them in plenty blossoms to every tree and shrub blossoms to wave mids the grasses on the wagils and morillas thick as the hairs on the opossum skin but yarage mare shall not always make them thus thick but only at times but the earth shall never again be quite bare of blossoms when they are few and the sweet breath wind is not blowing to bring first the showers and then the flowers and the bees can only make scarce enough honey for themselves then the valer or manna shall again drop from the trees to take the place of honey until yara gemara once more blows the rain down the mountain and opens the blossoms for the bees and then there will be honey for all now make haste and take this promise and the fadeless flowers which are the sign of it to your people the voice ceased then the virenans went back to their tribes back with the blossoms from bulima down the stone ladder which had been cut by the spirits for the coming of bayami they went across the wagis and over the murilas back to the camp of their tribes their people flocked round them gazing with wonder opened eyes at the blossoms the virenans carried fresh as when they left bulima where these flowers filling the air with fragrance when the tribes had gazed long at the blossoms and heard of the promise made to them by bayami through his messenger wala gurumbuan the virenans scattered the flowers from bulima far and wide some fell on the tree tops some on the plains and ridges and where they fell their kind have grown ever since the name of the spot where the virenans first showed the flowers and scattered them is still called giravin the place of flowers there after the bees of bami had made yarange blow the rain down the mountain of ubiubi to soften the frost hardened ground green grasses shot up framing fragrant bright flowers of many hues and the trees and shrubs blossomed thickly again 
and the earth was covered with cool grass and flowers as when bami walked on it it is the work of the bees of bami to make yarange the east wind blow the rain down the mountain that the trees may blossom and the earth bees make honey gladly does yarange do the bidding of the bees lighting the face of the earth with the smile of rain water for are not the guaymuten his relations the guaymuten whose dark blood is warm as is his and the messengers who come in the drought bringing manna are the black ants who bring the gun bean on to the leaves and the little gray birds called dullura who bring the valer or liquid manna and when they come the dians say a time of drought is here a great drought on all the land few are the flowers anywhere and the grass seed has gone but gun bean and valer will go and the drought will go and then the flowers and the bees will come again for so it has always been since the virenans brought the blossoms from bullima end of section 20
out gushed a stream of blood flowing swiftly down the bed of the river louder and louder rose the cries of the bungan bungan who carried stones with them following the stream as it rushed past they ran with leaps and bounds along the banks throwing in stones and crying aloud without ceasing gradually the stream of blood purified by the hot stones changed into flood water of which the cries of the bungan bungan warned the tribes so that they might move their camps on to the high ground before the water reached them while the flood water was running the bungan bungan never ceased crying aloud even to this day as a flood is coming are their voices heard and hearing them the dayans say the bungan bungan or flood frogs are crying out flood water must be coming then the bungan bungan are crying out flood water is here and if the flood water comes down red and thick the dayans say that the bungan bungan must have let it pass them without purifying it end of chapter 21 read by carrie adams your book voice at mesa arizona on the 8th of august 2022section 22 of more australian legendary tales this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by beeswax candle more australian legendary tales by k langlo parker erin the small grey owl erin the dayan was a very light sleeper, and when at night an enemy tried to steal into the camp to spear some one of the tribe or to crack a skull with his boondi, there was no chance of his being able to do so if Erin was there. For no sooner did the enemy get within spear shot of the camp than Erin would cry out, Mill! 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 which was, Aye! 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 meaning his tribe were to look out. There was danger threatening. And when at length Erin died, the Danes all grieved much, saying that now indeed their enemies would sneak upon them, and they would be unwarned, for none could hear as did Erin the light sleeper. They placed the body of Erin in a bark coffin, which they painted all over with red ochre. Before the ochre dried, the oldest Wirunun ran his thumbnail from one end to the other, then across the coffin, leaving thus divisions in the ochre forming a cross. This done, they corroboreed around the coffin, singing one of the death chants. Towards evening, they lifted up the coffin and carried it to the grave they had dug. The mourners were all painted and had leaves and feathers in their hair to heal tree twigs around their wrists, knees, ankles and waists, also through the holes in the cartilage of the noses. They carried bunches of deal twigs too in their hands. When they reached the grave, they laid some logs in the bottom which they thickly covered with deal twigs, on the top of which they put the coffin as a wail went up from all assembled, the mournful death wail of the tribe which rose and fell in wave-like cadences. Then an old Wirinun stood up and spoke, telling them that as Erin was now, so some day they all would be, and it behoved them to keep well the laws of Biami lest, when their spirits reached Bulima, they were not allowed to stay nor to wander at will, but were sent to the Ilianba Wanda, the abode of the wicked. After this address, more twigs were thrown on the coffin, then the things belonging to the dead were placed in the grave, rugs, weapons and food, which would be wanted on the journey to the sacred mountain, Ubi, Ubi. While this was being done, the oldest male relative stood in the grave to guard the body from the Wanda till the earth covered it. He stood there while a chant somewhat as follows was sung. We shall follow the bee to its nest in the gulaba. We shall follow it to its nest in the bibble tree. Honey too we shall find in the guri tree. But Erin the light sleeper will follow with us no longer. 
Then the mourners wailed to the Wirununs chanted again. Many were the days when we took our nets to the river. Many and big were the codfish we caught in them. But Erin the light sleeper will go no more to the river. No more will he rub himself with the oil of codfish. Erin will never eat again of the codfish. Then as the Wirununs paused, the wailing was loud again, till they began once more the dirge. We will spear Bora on the Murilas, and Dinawan shall fall when we throw. But Erin will hunt with us no longer. Never again will Erin eat of our hunting. Hunt shall we often, and oft shall we find. But the widow of Erin will kindle no fires for his coming. Loud again was the wailing. Then on went the voice of the Wirunun. Never again shall the voice of the light sleeper cry, Mill, 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 as an enemy nears us. Cracked will our skulls be and speared our bodies. Erin can warn us no more with his cry. Only his spirit can come to us ever, an offering let us now pour to it. Then with loud wailing, seizing stone knives and kumaboos, the mourners cut themselves, letting their blood drop into the grave. Never before was there such a blood offering. Then the earth was thrown quickly into the grave, while some of the mourners corroborated around it, crooning a dirge. When the earth was filled in, all stood in a dense smoke that the Wirinuns had made of the Buddha twigs, which was to keep them free from the unseen spirits known to be hovering around. When the grave was filled in, back to their new camp went the women, for the old one was now Gurmal, a place of death, with a marked tree showing it was taboo. No children or women with children who could not walk were allowed to go to the funeral. After the women left, all the men stood round the grave, the oldest Wirinun at the head, which faced the east. The men bowed their heads as if at a first Bura. The Wirinun lifted his, and looking towards where Bulama was supposed to be, said, Buy me, let in the spirit of Erin to Bulama. Save him, we ask thee, from the Ilyanba Wunda, abode of the wicked. Let him into Bulima, there to roam as he wills, for Erin was great on earth and faithful ever to your laws. Hear then now cry, O Biami, and let Erin enter the land of beauty, of plenty, of rest, for Erin was faithful on earth, faithful to the laws you left us. Then standing round the grave, all wailed the Gunai, or death dirge. And the men covered the grave with boughs of deal trees, and swept a clear space all round it. By the tracks on that space in the morning, they would know of what Ma was he who caused the death of Erin. If on it was the track of an iguana, then had one of the Biwi clan done it. The track of an emu, then was a dinner one guilty. The widow of Erin had put mud over herself, daubing her head and face with white, she slept by a smouldering smoke all night. Three days afterwards, the Dayan made a fire by the river. They chased the widow and her sisters down to it. The widow caught hold of a smoking bush from the fire, put it under her arm, and jumped into the middle of the water. As the smoking bush was going out, she drank a draught of the smoky water, and she came out and stood in the smoke of the fire. When she was thoroughly enveloped in the smoke, she called to those in the camp, and looking towards her husband's grave, she called again. Those in the camp called to her that a spirit had answered. She might speak now. She had been obliged to keep silence, except for death wails since Erin's death. Back she went to the camp. A big smoke was made, and the whole camp smoked. Every time a stranger came, the widow made a smoke, until the time arrived when the nearest of her husband's kin could claim her for his own. For some months after the death of Erin, every time a stranger came to the camp, early the next morning he would sing the Gunai or dirge. Then each man would take part in turn till all was singing. And they all moved out of their camps and gradually closed round into a smaller circle, where they would cease singing, sit down and rocking their bodies to and fro, they would cry and wail. When the time of mourning was over, an enemy came again to attack them but they were saved by hearing the old cry of Mill! 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 And so it often happened. At last an enemy died, and carried his hatred of them to another world, whence he returned as a spirit to attack them. But again they were saved by the warning cry of Mill! 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 This cry, they discovered, was made by a little grey owl, 
with black rings round its eyes, which, having warned the camp, flew from it. The wonder, or evil spirit, saw it, and said, Why do you warn them? Keep quiet next time I go to sneak upon them. See, I have my boondi. I will kill one of the tribe quickly. You can join me in my feast of his flesh. The bird promised silence. And the wounder went again into the camp. But just as he was going to raise his boondi to deal a fatal blow, Mill, 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 was cried in the sleeper's ear. The owl had followed the wounder into the camp. Why did you do that? the wounder angrily asked. That I shall always do, even as when I was here in the man, for did not my tribe spill freely the blood offering? Shall I not then save them from the wounder, even as I did from their old enemies? By day I shall rest, and at night I shall roam, hovering round their camps to guard them by my cry, when danger threatens them. And so it has been ever since. The spirit of Eren, the light sleeper, is in the little grey owl, which is called Eren too, and ever warns its old tribe at night by crying, Mill, Mill, Mill! End of section 22. Section 23 of More Australian Legendary Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. More Australian Legendary Tales by K. Langlo Parker. The Legend of Narung Awi, the Sacred Island. Nagrunduri, the giver of laws, customs, and a religion to the southern tribes of the aboriginals in South Australia, became to them as a god, and his promise was ever believed, that if they followed the laws he had given them, after death, their spirits should follow his footsteps over the island of Narungawi, and thence be translated as he was, to his home in the skies. The tradition was that his departure took place somewhat as follows. His two wives ran away from him. In going after them, he crossed what is now called Lake Albert, went on for some distance over the Karang to the sea, and along the beach past the present Port Victor to Cape Jarvis. When he arrived there, he saw the fugitives wading through the water, being when he sighted them about halfway across the channel, which at that time was quite a shallow one, between the mainland and Narangawi, as Kangaroo Island was then called. Enraged at his wives for running away from him, Nagrunduri determined to punish them. He bade the water to rise up and drowned them. With a terrific rush, the water rose, and the women were carried back towards the mainland. They tried to swim against this tidal wave, but were powerless to do so, and a terror-stricken pair were drowned, and their bodies were turned into rocks, which were called Rhinejulang, and can be seen to this day, and are known to the white people as the pages or two sisters. After his wives were drowned, Nagrunduri walked into the water and dived out towards the island. Where he emerged from the water is a black patch three or four yards in width. He went on to the island, and as the day was hot, he wished for a shade to rest under. Seeing none, he made spring from the earth a she-oak tree, which is said to be the largest in Australia. He lay down in the shade and tried to sleep, but could not, for as every breeze blew, he heard the wailing of his drowning wives' voices through the treetop. Finding he could get no rest, he walked to the end of the island. He threw his spear out into the sea, and immediately a reef of rocks came from the island to where the spear dropped. He then threw away 
all his other weapons and departed to his home in the skies, where those who have kept the laws he gave the tribes will someday join him. And to this day, anyone who tries to sleep under a she-oak tree will hear the wailing that Negrunduri, the greatest of all, heard. As he lay beneath that giant tree, he had made to shade him on Narungawi, that island which ever afterwards was held as sacred to him and the spirits of the dead by the southern tribes of South Australia. End of section 23. Section 24 of More Australian Legendary Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Beeswax Candle. More Australian Legendary Tales by K. Langlo Parker. Glossary. Barlu. Moon. Masculine. Bargi. Grandmother. Birion. A small grey lizard. Barai Barai. The boys. Orion's sword and belt. Bibble, shiny-leaved box tree. Bigoon, water rat. Bilba, a large rat. Bindia, prickle or thorn. Bingarwingul, needlebush, a flowering shrub with roots from which water can be drained. Bingui, wooden vessel for holding water. Biragnulu, woman's name. Equals faced like a hatchet handle. Bora, kangaroo. Buli, whirlwind. Bundi, club-headed weapon. Bura, larger bora ring. Bora or bura, sacred tribal initiation rites. Buka, leek. Brelga, native companion, large crane. Bubalami, Game played by jumping into the water with a splash. Bubua, giant brown and yellow snake. Budta, rosewood tree. Budta, salt. Bulla bulla, butterflies. Bulai bulai, green parrot. Bulima, Biamese camp, native Elysium. Bulimedi mundi, southeast. Bungan bungan, frog. Buna, cannibal, Bayami, big man, creator, culture hero. Kambi, bag. Kambiji bundaranghilada, grey moth. Komabu, tomahawk. Kula, tree with water holding roots. Korobori, tribal dance. Dayen, black fellow. Deengi Hinda Mailiena, Venus the Laughing Star, literally a laughing man. Dadur, shelter made of bark. Dayul, magical speaking stone. Dini, iron bark. Diriri, woolly wagtail. Dial, sacred tree. Dindi, pointed stick. Dinawan, emu. Dinjira, West, Dulumai, Thunder, Dungaira, Lightning, Duwi, Dream Spirit, Dorandoran, North Wind, Dulora, Small Grey Birds, Dulai Mulai Luna, Feud, Vendetta, Dumer, Brown Pigeon, Dari, Bread Made from Grass Seed, Darun, The Night Heron, Ihu, rain. Urdur, mirage. Ualahi, language of Naran blacks. Uluwiri, rainbow. Ura, a drooping shrub. Garimei, camp. Garaga, crane. Gayande, man's name for voice of Bora spirit. Gayadari, platypus. Giga Giga, the cold west wind. Gidja, 
tree of acacia species, which gives forth a sickening smell in damp weather, or if in bloom. Girawin, place of flowers. Gudu, codfish. Gulaba, grey-leaved box tree. Gulayul, water-holding tree. Gulayali, pelican. Gulmai, death dirge. Gumbilga, bark canoe. Gumblegobun, turkey or bustard of the plains. Gunagula, the sky. Goonbean, specks on the leaves of the bibble. Guwira, small stick or bone possessing magical death dealing power. Gogogaga, laughing jackass. Guba, good. Gobi, man's clan name. Gubara, sacred wonder working stone. Guinebo, red breast. Gumal, place where someone has died. Gundoi, solitary emu. Gunyanu, southeast wind. Gubra, north. Ilyawe laya, goodbye, said by one going. Inara, mistress. Kumburan, east. Kuria, alligator. Me, totem. Mambeya, white devil who carries a green bundi. Mai, wind. Mayama, stone. Myra, wind. Mia May, the girls, Pleiades. Mil, I. Minga, spirit haunted tree. Miria, polygonum. Mudai, opossum. Mugare, hailstones. Murila, pebbly ridge. Mabu, beefwood tree. Maboon, small creek running into a larger one. Mugil, stone knife. Mulayer, Mate, companion. Muli, muli, dream spirit. Of Wirinun. Muloka, water spirit. Mandawada, northwest wind. Mangi ware ware mul, seagull. Mangun yali, iguana, largest kind of. Murga mugui, trapdoor spider. Murumin, bark. Nunga, Kurawong tree. Nungabara, belonging to the Nunga country. Nuragogo, orange and blue beetle. Nurun Nurumbin, south wind. Nurumba, hunting ground. Numbadi, mother. Nuruluan, south. Niunu, grass humpy. Ubi Ubi, Miami's mountain dwelling place in the other world. Udule, round rain-making stone. Ula, red prickly lizard. Una, give. Uyabului, black snake. Piggibilla, spiny echidna. Polimil, woman's name. Equals starry eyes. Waa, shell. Waler, mana running down stems of branches. Wan, crow. End of section 24. End of More Australian Legendary Tales by K. Langlow Parker.